We convinced the Colombians through a series of undercover negotiations that I was in to deliver a DC-6 filled with marijuana and cocaine from the northern coast of Colombia to a small town in downriver Michigan onto an airport on an island known as Gross Hill. And they delivered 670 kilograms of cocaine and nine tons of marijuana that landed at six o'clock in the morning on this, what used to be a military base, now it was a recreational airport in this small little island 20 minutes south of Detroit. So I had no idea until you got in the car today that it was you who was the DEA agent on the plane with Pablo Escobar's wife and son when yep. they were trying to get to Frankfurt, Germany, shortly before he got whacked in 93. That's exactly right. It was me. And before they got on a flight to Frankfurt, they also had tickets to London. Mm. And little people know that. So I didn't know where I was going until they got on the plane. And it was just you? There was no one else? No, there was two other Colombian National Police officers that mm. traveled with me. Plain clothes, obviously. Yep, yep. Yeah. They didn't know who we were. They had no idea that DEA was on a plane following them. Oh, they, they didn't know that you were No, there. the Columbia National Police did, but the Escobars oh, okay. had no clue. No, Got the it. three of us traveled together, the two CNP officers and myself. And um, and it was, it was interesting, and nobody really knew we were DEA or police entities on that airplane. No one, not the flight attendants, wow. no one. It was just us, and we're whole goal there was to monitor the Escobar movement, get them kicked out of Germany and return back because we realize when you chase a fugitive, when you're after a fugitive, the whole key to finding most fugitives is the family. Mm. Where's the family? Where's the loved one? Where's mom? Where are my kids? Whatever the case may be. If you speak to a United States Marshal, they, and if they've been looking for a fugitive for a long time, they're going to look right at you and say, tell me his kids' birthdays and his wife's birthday and his mom's birthday, and I'll have them within a year. Because most people, even they may lead a life of crime, are regular people who can love and mm. cherish and want to give birthday presents to their kids or to their mom or to their wife or whatever. So, major Even future. Pablo Escobar. Even Pablo Escobar. Even Pablo Escobar. He loved his family. And it's his love of his family which ultimately took him down that day. He would mm. eventually have been taken down, but... It was the love of his family because he was so infuriated that his family got kicked out of Germany, he started making phone calls. Mm. And this is also well documented in the book, My Father, Pablo Escobar, by his son, uh, Juan Pablo. It's um, He told the truth about that. He told the whole story about how his father wanted him out of, Germ out of Colombia and because... Los Pepes and the rest of the people, the Cali cartel, which was funding the Los Pepes, which were trying to kill Pablo Escobar, were now killing his attorneys, babysitters, mm. nannies, homeschool teachers, you name it. Anybody associated with Pablo Escobar, Los Pepes were killing. So that's why he wanted his family out of there. And DEA seized on the opportunity. We followed him. We met with the agents in Germany. And... It was very interesting in Germany because I spoke to the agent in, that was assigned to Germany. I said, I've got my bag here. Because what happened was they took the Escobar family off the plane. And you could look out the window and you could see tanks and all sorts of people and military lining the sides of the runway, escorting this mm. in for whatever reason because they knew the Escobars were on there. So they stopped the airplane in the middle of the tarmac, got the Escobars off. And as agents, we waited on the plane, and then we met with the DE agents from Germany. And I was explaining to the agent in Germany, I said, yeah, I got my briefcase here, I got a bunch of undercover photos from the plane. He goes, just keep that low profile, don't let the Germans know. And I said, okay. Oh, he so goes, you had pictures on the plane too, you were oh, taking I, them the whole time. Exactly, exactly. And so one of the reasons he explained to me is that some of the laws in Germany, and I don't claim to know those laws, I was just taking the advice of the lead agent in Germany, mm -hmm. Because of what has happened in Germany over the years, where people have been persecuted and their rights have been violated, they've created all sorts of laws where law enforcement can 
have serious restrictions placed on them that what we would be considering traditional investigative techniques. I believe he even said, and I don't know if he said this in sarcasm, was if a German officer's on surveillance, if he writes down somebody's license plate on surveillance, they've got to document it. So mm. take that for what it's worth. That's what he told me. He, he might have been just trying to explain to me the, 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 the aspect of how the Germans are so careful in regards to not violating people's rights. Well, they don't have the best history with that, so I kind of get it. No, I can give you six million reasons why. Yeah, why for they sure. Don't have a good record for that. I was looking at that the other day too, like the official numbers, like thirty-three through forty-five, where they were counting all deaths. I think it was excluding deaths of German soldiers in the war. The Nazis were responsible for like 21 million total killings, obviously including a lot of their own people. And it was, at the time, around 1% of the world population. It's mind-boggling. And what's even more mind-boggling is when you speak to those nine year old, 90-something-year-olds that were fortunate enough to get out of Germany at the mm -hmm. time. I, I have an organization that I work with where we honor military veterans. And one of them uh, was a guy named Guy Stern, and he's still alive. He was part of an elite unit called the Ritchie Boys, and the Ritchie mm. Boys were an intelligence unit, and that's something that you can do a little bit of research on another time, but 60 Minutes aired them for 20 minutes. It was so popular. It's one of the few 60-minute episodes they reran and did the entire 60 minutes. But the Ritchie Boys guy, Stern, and I honored him, and it talked to these Holocaust survivors and the people that made it out. Real quick, Ritchie Boys were an intelligence unit made up of people that were German refugees that have led, left Germany and they created mm. an intelligence team to go back to Germany and work on on uh, solving some of the atrocities during the war and getting information and intelligence. So back to Escobar and the family going to Germany. Um, it was fascinating, the trip. And uh, I kiddingly say, who's the only guy ever to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the Escobars two days in a row? And that would be me when it comes to the <laughs> DEA. So the only DEA guy to ever do that was me. Was there a layover on that? No. Or was that a I, No, wait, come to think of it, we stopped in Caracas on the way over there with the Lutanza jet. Mm. We stopped in Caracas, I think, to tap off the fuel tank, and then we worked our way to Germany. Wow. All right, so I'm going to bury that lead a little bit because people, sure. people are like, holy shit. Obviously, a lot of people are huge fans of the stories around the, the Medellin cartel and Pablo Escobar and everything. It's It's been... Incredibly represented in mass media as well. You had Narcos come out, which I believe those are some of your friends, Pena and, and absolutely. And, and we Steve. Were, we all worked on the same team in Bogota together, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena. The way it worked was we had a group that was assigned. It was the Medellin Task Force, basically. That's for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. But uh, we had a code name, Operation Boulevard, and we also had. Um, the group, it was uh, a group that was led by a group supervisor and at the federal level, that's what they call a grade 14. And he had several grade 13s working for him. Mm. I was the backup supervisor. So if the lead supervisor couldn't be there, I was the backup supervisor. And, um, myself and Murphy and Pena were on that team as well as a few other agents. I won't mention their names because, they weren't part of this um, permission right. to actually be able to speak. And obviously, Javier and Steve have put their name out there. Sure. But uh, overall, the whole thing was run by our country attache, a guy by the name of Joe Toft. He was and, the head of the DEA? Yeah, he was the country attache in Bogota. Okay. And uh, the head of the DEA in Bogota, Joe Toft. And uh, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, his, he's very well documented as well as being part of the Escobar investigation. And uh, he's one... One great boss, one tough son of a bitch, and that's what you needed there. You needed somebody who was yeah. a good boss, a good leader, but somebody who was tough. And he was really tough on us. He was really tough on us. And uh, But I developed a very good relationship with him uh, that I have till this day. I went and visited him where he lives in another part of the United States just last year, and I talked to him on the phone about once a month. That's pretty cool. But what I what I wanted to tell you about Joe real briefly is that you needed that almost Vince Lombardi type of toughness in a coach mm. because it's not like if you fumbled the ball, the other team got it. It's not like if you were off sides, it was a five-yard penalty. If you made a mistake, people die. 
and he had a lot of responsibility and a lot of pressures. And he uh, he was a no-nonsense leader, no-nonsense boss who demanded excellence, and he got excellence. Clearly. And I love, and I love the guy, but Joe Toft is a guy that uh, is an um, unnamed hero in this whole story. He periodically pops up on interviews, but if it wasn't for Pablo, or if it wasn't for Joe Toft, the Pablo Escobar investigation would have ended, but it would have ended differently. And uh, so, just wanted to throw some props out there to Joe Toft, country attaché, leader in DEA, and he retired very shortly after the Escobar investigation. I mean, look, it was it was an incredible success taking that guy down. It's it's hard for a lot of people to fathom if they haven't studied exactly how big he was and what he was in charge of but it's not that he was the only guy down there we know he wasn't but the the range of his rule over a vicious empire was dramatic to say the least i mean this you're talking about a guy who was technically even an official politician at some point a guy who could build his own prison we'll talk about all this today i'm sure but he could build his own prison when he agrees to go to prison for a short time and then escape when he wants you know he would buy off entire neighborhoods and all the while he's sending kilos and kilos and kilos and kilos and kilos of drugs all over the world and to say nothing of obviously the united states where there's a huge market and you know it's just it's wild to me that this was only like 30 years ago. This is not that long ago. And it's also wild to me that we see a lot of these same problems still today, less from Colombia in this case and more from Mexico. But, you know, the circle of life there is, is certainly interesting. Before we get to all that, though, what about you? Where, where are you from? How did, how did you, and did you like dream of being a DEA agent? I know you couldn't have because it wasn't even around in the 80s. Well, that's a great question, and you told me earlier, if I want to emphasize a point, look straight at the camera look straight like that. at the camera right there. And, that's um, good. One of the things I can tell you about myself is when I was younger, I was born and raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My father was a neurologist at the University of Michigan. My mother was a social justice warrior, uh, social worker in the Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County, Michigan area. So you don't like Ohio State too much? No, we, <laughs> we're not real big on Ohio State in Ann Arbor. As a matter of fact, uh, not in the slightest. And uh, <laughs> as I was telling you on the car ride over here, I've written several books on Michigan football, and one of them is on the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry. Mm. So, but, so a huge football fan, born and raised in Ann Arbor, and I barely got out of high school. I was kind of a young... I had four brothers who were extremely brilliant, and uh, or I'm sorry, three brothers, and of the four boys, the four McGee boys, there's only two of us left, but the other three were really smart guys, great entertainers, very great at academics. Me, not so much. I was kind of a kid that got in a lot of trouble. Nothing that would send me to prison, but definitely stuff that was very mischievous that would give me the label of, if he's not careful, he's going to be a juvenile delinquent. Mm. It was more than throwing snowballs at cars. It was sometimes borrowing bicycles that didn't belong to me, whatever the case may be. That's okay. But that's when I was a young, young teen. And then I got into high school and I met somebody. And that was a police officer. Her name was Tanya Pageant. Mm. And Tanya took a liking to me, would talk to me. I always liked talking to her about police stories. And she said, well, it's a great career. Shortly thereafter, they had a summer camp. And I was just talking about this with a major from the Michigan State Police yesterday in the gym. And that summer camp was for kids that wanted to go into law enforcement for 15, 16-year-olds. I graduated first in that camp. The prize was I got to ride in a Michigan State Police helicopter. <laughs> they had a summer camp for, like, would-be cops? 15, 16-year-olds. It was put on by the Kiwanis, the Michigan State Police, and the Ann Arbor Police. Very similar, like an explorer's hmm. camp. We camped out. I was looking at the schedule the other day. I pulled out the book so I could show it to the major from the state police. I said, Joe, take a look at this. They had us up at 6 in the morning, and we had classes till 9 o'clock at night, six days in a row. So I just really liked law enforcement, and I liked the idea, the excitement, and things of that nature. And um, graduating first in my class, my mom says, "Hey, you know, you can do this. You can, mm. you can become a productive citizen. You're not a fuck up." <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I will tell you, on my 18th birthday, I went out with my buddies. We went celebrating. When I got home, obviously we'd probably been out having a few cocktails. I got home. There's a note on my pillow from my mother who worked in the criminal justice system. She says in this note, I open it, it's hand typed, signed at the bottom by my mother, written on uh, customized stationery from the county pretrial release juvenile justice program. 
It says, Dear Son, I want you to know as of two minutes ago, it was past midnight when I'm typing this, and you officially reached the age of 18. Oh, no. Which is the legal <laughs> age of an adult in the state of Michigan. And then she went on to say, if you are to get into problems and commit a felony, you will be taken directly to jail and you will no longer be able to call your mother to try and smooth the situation out with the juvenile justice oh, authorities. Shit. Mom wasn't messing around. And then at the very end, it said, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and she signed her name like she was signing an official document. But by that time, I'd already gotten up all the, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just um, the call. To want to be? Well, the call to want to be, but I had already gotten out of my system all those antics that kids do and pranks and things like that, mm. you know, and, and I was past that. So I ended up going to school. Uh, I didn't have the greatest grades in high school. I went to Northeastern University in Boston and spent one year there, got on the dean's list three times in a row, studying criminal justice. I really loved the topic, transferred to Michigan State. Ended up graduating first in my Wait class. Wait a minute. You yeah, graduated yeah. from Michigan State and yeah. you're a Michigan man? Yeah, a lot of people ask me about that. I, I don't know to, about that one. Well, I a lot of people ask me about that, and I have a fun story about that in a minute. But in conclusion, I ended up getting my bachelor's and master's from Michigan State. And I graduated first in my class for bachelor's. And I ended up also uh, going to Michigan for a while uh, to work on an exercise physiology degree. Okay. All right. But... What I was going to tell you, the story about Michigan State, I was a walk-on kicker at Michigan State when Daryl Rogers was the coach. I ended up getting cut because they recruited a guy named Morton Anderson. Oh, yeah. And Morton Anderson's good. in the College Football <laughs> Hall of Fame and the Pro Football yeah. Hall of Fame. But I'll never forget, I was at I was at home, summer vacation, and I went to a house, a barbecue, and Bo Schembechler, who was a family friend of ours, was at the party with somebody else, and I'm in the living room, and... Mrs. Pilcher looks at me and she says, hey, Kenny, this is right in front of Bo. Now that you're going to Michigan State, who are you pulling for the, in the big game in the fall? And there's Bo staring at me like, what am I going to say? I mean, I've idolized this guy, played Little League with his kids. And yeah. to this day, I'm very close with the Schembechler family. And he says, he looks at me and he could see that I was struggling to even speak because I <laughs> idolized Bo. And he looks at me and he says, Kenny. Before you answer that question, let me tell you one thing. I would think very little of anyone who wasn't rooting for the school that they were attending. And then he just stares at me. And I said, I understand, Bo. I got it. Thank you so much. And I graduate in a couple of years and I'll be back. <laughs> So, so he was, he was, that was not what I expected him to say right there, but he was a legend. He's that guy's in the hall of fame, right? Oh, absolutely. He's like in everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, a lot of people don't know that Bo was also a coach at Ohio state at one time. I didn't so know that. Bo worked for Woody Hayes at, at Ohio state. So being raised in Ann Arbor in the shadows of the big house, uh, it was an incredible time. I learned a lot. Um, met a lot of great people. I often talk about young people today need three things in life, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Three things. If I was a parent of a young person today, I would strive to have my child have three things. And that is heroes, mentors, and role models. Mm -hmm. And Bo Schembechler was all three of those things to me. Wow. Thanks for asking. That was a good trip down memory lane. Yeah. Go, and uh, go blue. Yeah, and you would later, like skipping way ahead here, but didn't you do like... You ran like the security for the school for a couple of years, like after your career. Yeah, they a lot of people like to call it security, but it was actually a police department. And um, mm. one of my goals when I became the chief of police at the University of Michigan was to elevate the stature so people would look at it as a police department. Mm. I think it was very effective in doing that, from having um, advanced tactical units to enhancing the detective bureau increasing uh, awareness of the sexual assaults on campus. I made mm. it much more of a police-oriented agency as opposed to a security agency. And I was proud to do that. However, sometimes your dream job is not your dream job. So I left after a couple of years at the University of Michigan and went on and pursued other things. And But uh, it was some of the best times I ever had in my career was being the chief of police at Michigan. But then again, sometimes it was also some of the most frustrating times. Mm. I could imagine why I would probably go down a rabbit hole with that one. But, absolutely, absolutely. But, you I know, mean, when the career before that, though. I mean, you're going from, you're going from the most adventurous stuff ever to then. I mean, let's call it what it is. You're you're the head of a police force on a college campus where kids are partying and getting drunk and buying some of the drugs that you were stopping, going from the source down there. That's got to be a 
big curveball. That's one way to look at it, and you're exactly right. But uh, as I've often said, sometimes it's not necessarily the kids on campus that you're concerned about or that cause you to stay awake at night or give you headaches. It's sometimes the administrators. Mm. And uh, sometimes the administrators want the images of the university to look a certain way. And when you're a retired federal agent who <laughs> really believes in truth and justice in the American way and salutes the flag and does all of those things, you can still love the university, you can love the sports programs and things of that nature, but you can also be somewhat frustrated with some of the direction that the people above you mm. want you as a law enforcement leader to take. Hey guys, if you saw the previous two episodes, you probably heard me announce that the Patreon is officially live. I want to take a moment two weeks in to thank everyone who has joined that. I do not take that lightly at all, and it is more initial support than I anticipated, so I'm very, very grateful to see that. And besides the Patreon, we also have the channel Julian Dory Clips Live. It's been up since January 2nd, I think. We are posting daily mid-form clips on YouTube. You can access it by hitting the channels panel on my main page on YouTube, which it says Julian Dory Clips, and there it is. Hope to see you guys subscribe. Other than that, back to the episode. So, I'm not there anymore. I'll let you come I'll to leave, your I'll, I'll leave that one I'll right let you there. come to your own conclusion. But I still love the sports teams, go to all the games, and uh, when I was talking about honoring a veteran, we that's where we honor the veterans at the Michigan football games, and we get them on the field in the second oh, quarter. Cool. Second quarter of the game, you march this veteran on the field, and 110,000 people stand up and cheer. It's outstanding. Gives you chills. Very cool. Okay. That's, that's a really, really so that, cool thing. That's me in a nutshell. And then um, I graduated uh, from Michigan State. I also went to the police academy during that time. Did and you so, have, I'm, I'm just curious, I'm sorry to butt in, but sure. like, did you have some sort of experience when you were in high school or college or something where you got passionate specifically like on the subject of drugs or did that just, did you kind of fall into that? Career? No, that, and that's a great question. That, that's an excellent question. And uh, real quick, because I didn't make the transition from college straight to the DEA. Right. There was a four-year gap there where I worked at the Jackson, Michigan Police Department as a patrolman, and I also uh, worked as a firefighter because I was laid off for a little while. And that was a uh, that was a good training ground to learn how to be a professional police officer. And I saw a lot of a lot of things that uh, gave me a lot of experience. Had a Michigan State Police Trooper get shot and killed. And I was with him when he died on the side of the highway. Mm -hmm. And well, he died in the hospital, but I rendered safe first aid to him until we got him to the hospital in the back of an ambulance. And I had a firefighter, building collapsed. He died. I lived. Um, so a lot of interesting things for those first few years as the as a young patrolman. So the age of innocence is it's gone. Once once you see a state trooper with bullet holes in him on the side of a snowy highway on February of 1982, and you're just some 23-year-old kid. It changes you. It changes you a lot. How did you, you deal know? with that? Well, I was young enough that I didn't have PTSD and things like that, and I, I, I looked at it more as a learning experience, but it's a tragedy, and I also learned... I have a f feeling that I've always had this saying, and that is take life's tragedies and turn them into treasures. Mm. So that tragedy led me to say, okay, whenever you're in a uniform, always make sure you have your bulletproof vest on. This trooper had bulletproof vest on, but it didn't have side panels. Mm -hmm. Ironically, his wife, after he died, created um, a, a strong, strong grassroots movement to have police agencies require bulletproof vests to have side panels on them. Because mm. one of the reasons Trooper Craig Scott died was the bullet, one bullet went in here through his side, one went in to the lower right-hand side. And so she took that tragedy and turned it into treasure and has probably saved numerous lives in law enforcement since then. So I was young enough that I, I used it as a learning lesson. And the same thing when the firefighter died in front of me and, uh, because it was an arson, I had to go to his autopsy the next day and, and catalog the autopsy Ugh. and document it. But it was those things that 
It was no longer, oh, you're driving in a patrol car, you take your car through the car wash, right. you, may, you wave to people, you go take a little complaint, there might be a B&E, might be a stolen bicycle, might be a slip and fall, who knows? Who knows? And then that happens. Mm. It changed everything. So let me get back to your question about the drugs. And so I was, as a patrolman, I s decided I wanted to try and become a federal agent. So I ended up applying to the DEA. And what year is this? This is in 19, when I applied for DEA, it was probably around 1983. I ended up getting hired in September. No, I take that back. I had applied much earlier, right out of college, and here's what happened. And here's a good story for your listeners, and that is when you're in an interview, always tell the truth. So what happened was, right out of college, I applied for the DEA. And we're going to get to the passion about fighting drugs and all that in a minute. And what happened was, I um, ended up having a situation where in, or in high school, I had experimented with marijuana. Mm -hmm. At the time, if you smoked marijuana at any time in your life, you were bounced from the application process. That's tough. A lot of people getting bounced. <laughs> so that was that was in the early, early, early 80s. And I told the truth. And I'm glad I did. And um, and I, I reached out to some of my mentors. And I said, this is the dilemma. Just tell them. And they said, tell them the truth. And that's exactly what I did. And that bounced me from the process. Well, it turns out the recruiter was also a re uh, graduate of Michigan State. Three years later, he had my name on a list of people. He called me and said, they have changed the policy. <laughs> they now allow experimental use. Mm. And I said, outstanding. Now, I, what do they mean by experimental? By experimental, yeah. you could not have bought it or sold it and used it in a social situation due to one of a few different reasons. Peer pressure, curiosity and did not continue repeated use after that. Oh, so you just weren't like a repeated use guy then in that scenario. Yeah, I'd, I had tried some weed in high school. Right, you know, it wasn't for you. Do, at this point in time, how many years ago was that? 50 years ago? I don't remember if it was two or three or four or five or one or two. It just wasn't. Right. It wasn't something like, I'm like, hey, do you remember, bra when we used to go back and <laughs> get stoned in the back of your VW? You know, no, it wasn't like that. So they don't sit around at the DEA with all the with all the weed that they still get over there and like, you know, pass a joint? That what doesn't happen? Yeah, what movie did you watch last night? That showed that? <laughs> I'm convinced that still happens. I'm yeah. convinced with the weed it's different. No, but. we do have random drug tests as well. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, we, we, I mean, I figure you do, but weed's one. That's one that's that's pretty easy to hide. Yeah. Oh well, if you if you're smart enough to become a DEA agent, you're probably smart enough to either a make sure you don't smoke weed, True. or b find that masking technique. But ultimately, you're going to get busted. And uh, have agents been busted? Absolutely. I was going to say that one's like so different. You not know? not often. Not often. I remember once. Um, I remember there was an agent in New York City that had a opioid issue and he died of a mm. drug overdose so things That's happen some real shit right but, there yeah yeah but let me let me tell you let me tell you so many of the de agents they're honest people they don't smoke weed they hate drugs you know their drug of choice could be alcohol it could be sports it could be whatever my point is they could really enjoy other things in life but they take their job very seriously they're professionals mm -hmm. You know, you have to go through hell to get on the job and then go through hell working your way to becoming a member of DEA. Yeah. And then once you're with DEA, you basically sign your soul away and they can send you wherever they want, whenever they want, however they want. And you had just wanted to be a federal agent. And this it sounds like this was just the one that you selected to go to because it was a newer agency. I think it started in like this. Was it the 70s or 80s? The title was new. The agency is old. It, it used to be the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. And then okay. in the mid early 70s, I think it was 73, became the DEA. Got it. And for your listeners, it's the Drug Enforcement Administration. If you're taking a test after this, it's not the Drug Enforcement Agency. You'd be amazed. I read books 
or I read investigative journalist articles where and they, they say that, that up? and they call it the Drug Enforcement Agency. Oh, they that's get a an Google F, away. They get an F on their report card. No question about it. Yeah, you got to get that right. Yeah, no, that's, it's it's yeah. one thing if you're doing it in conversation, but if you're like if you're writing a book and you get that wrong, that's a Google away. Or when I have the guy interviewing me and he says, "Well, tell me what it was like to be in Bogota." And I'm like, Bogota. And he said, yeah. And I said, you know, I had a Chinese restaurant last month and somewhere in Michigan named the Bogota. Are you talking about Bogota? Alicia. So, 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 you know, and some people do a lot of research before their interviews. Some people don't, you mm-hmm. know, and I've had them both. And uh, unfortunately, you're one of the ones that did a lot of research ahead of time. Well, I love this topic. Oh, I bet you I've do. Been... Have you ever been to Bogota? Uh, never. Have you ever been to Bogota? <laughs> never. I've okay. never been there for sure. I've never been to the real one. Let's, but... cir- let's circle back real quick. We'll, sure. we'll get back to your original question because it defines me, some of these things. And remember, what was the, the sad I, thing I said about tragedies? What do we turn them into? Treasures. Learning. Uh-huh. Treasures. Tragedies to treasures. Take a tragedy in your life and turn it into a treasure. I had a father, very famous brain doctor, a neurologist at the University of Michigan, wrote books, just a, one of the most brilliant men in the world. He became a medical doctor at the age of 18. They let that happen? Yeah, they did. Wow. And he was, he was phenomenal. He knew neurology. These days, neurologists rely on machines that can just scan your brain. My dad was incredible. But he was also an alcoholic. Mm. He wasn't a mean alcoholic. wasn't a raging wild alcoholic. He just, after work, he drank himself to sleep. And this continued and continued and continued. And ultimately, it killed him. My parents got divorced several years before. My dad died at the age of 56 of alcoholism. I had an older brother. His name was Bobby. For you listeners... My last name is McGee, Bobby McGee. You can put two and two together. Was my brother part of Janis Joplin's song, Me and Bobby McGee? No, it wasn't. But if you listen to that song, they, there's a line about putting my harpoon in my dirty bandana. Well, the harpoon in the drug culture is a hypodermic needle, mm. a bandana, where you hide your stash. Well, Bobby McGee was a great musician and a very good guy. However, he became extremely involved in drugs at a young age, and ultimately he died of a heroin overdose. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So my brother- When was di- that? My brother who died of a heroin overdose was in the early 2000s. Oh, fa- so this is long after you were in the agency. Yeah, my father, my father died two months after that state trooper died. So it was 1982 mm-hmm. that happened. So in that same 82, I had the trooper die, my dad died. And firefighter Norm Krieger died. So it was a, 82. It was a rough year. Why did you... I'm curious. I don't know if you ever learned this answer. So if, if you didn't, ignore it. But did your dad just start drinking habitually? Or was there That's something That's a great question, with? too. That's a great question. And my mom used to tell me what happened was my dad always wanted to be a surgeon. But he mm-hmm. had a hereditary disease that's called tremor. And there's a more of a medical term that's a little more sophisticated. Yeah. So for those of you looking at me in the camera, his hands would shake like this. Mm. And there wasn't the medications to help tremor. And he said alcohol was one of the things. And my dad just started to drink and he drank more and more. And I think it at the end, because he always wanted to be a brain surgeon, but he couldn't do it because of his hands shaking. So it bothered so, him so much. Oh, wow. So he would mask the shaking of his hands with the alcohol, make a long story short, it caught up with him. Yeah. And then it was no longer, I'm going to be a surgeon. I'm, I'm a world's renowned neurologist. I, I diagnose, I teach, I educate, I write, I do all those things. But the alcohol stayed with him. Mm. So here you have it. So Dad you, dies of alcoholism, brother is a raging drug addict. And Well, uh, how, long, how long were you aware? Because you, you said your brother died in the early 2000s? Yeah, yeah. So how long were you aware that he was a, a drug user? Oh, when I was like 12 years old. He was four years older than me. I was 12 years old. I'll never forget. My dad found his stash and his knee, hypodermic needle. And mm. at that time, he would have been about 16. But he went through every drug 
every drug known to man. He was a coke addict at one time, a heroin addict. Uh, he loved to smoke his weed. He was an alcoholic at times. And he was a really nice guy, a really funny guy. But ultimately, when he started getting into heavy drugs and continuing into that into his 20s and 30s, he died in his early 40s or mid 40s um, in Atascadero, California. He died, like I said, of that heroin overdose. And um, ultimately, I had to kind of disassociate myself with mm -hmm. him. I just said to him, Bobby, you know, I'm a federal narcotics agent and you have a serious drug problem. I love you like a brother, but you need to get help. When you get help, when you finally get clean and sober, and you've been that way for two years, call me. And we can reacquaint ourselves as brothers. So he he did. And uh, we got reacquainted for a while, and then he slipped again, and and uh, he never got he never got better. Wow. So, yeah. It's you know what it's it's the kind of thing when you're talking about substance abuse of any kind. Anyone out there who's fortunate enough to have a family, a bigger family, especially statistics say, you know, we all have someone close to us in our life who, who dealt with that. I've had several in my life and, and it's not, it's one of those things where you're almost fucked either way. You know, do you, do you always be there as, as their shoulder no matter what? And then it just enables it. Or do you have to have tough love or something like that and make hard decisions as, as you seem to for a while there and, you know, I, I just always try to remind myself I've only ever lived in my head. I can the best I can do is learn from what other people tell me is their experience. But you know, I see it, and and I have a lot of empathy for the fact that people just you know, there's some people who are wired in a way where they just can't. A lot of people who they they just can't kick that kind of thing. Right, right. Well, you were uh, very accurate, and the two examples you gave was the possible enabler showing them love and care and then after that tough love in reality that's the path you take as in my opinion because if you want there are a lot of people that do get clean and sober in the very beginning when you show them kindness and love and things of that nature and then some people it takes tough love yeah so in in the wide wide world of tiktok and my career going to different places and speaking to different groups of people there are always these people and you're going to have this on this broadcast when people write comments <laughs> they're going to say just legalize dope legalize yeah. it all legalize it do that you know we wouldn't have a problem with crime if we legalize it we could spend hours talking on that conversation we could and we absolutely could but I'm a firm believer in that those some of those people are the same people who say abolish the three letter agencies. Mm -hmm. And I and I often talk about this. And I just say, um, and and believe me, as a narcotics agent and as a cop and as a guy that cares about society, I do not think we're going to arrest our way out of the drug war. Mm -hmm. I don't think that arresting every single person with drugs is going to solve the problem. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's a difference between drug users and drug dealers. And drug dealers prey on the weak, and a lot of those become the drug users, number one. Number two is those same drug dealers are the ones causing a lot of violence. Legalizing drugs does not take the criminal element out of it. And we could spend days talking about this topic. But I'm a firm believer. How do, I, a quick question, though. Sure. How, how does it not... The criminal element's going to be the criminal element, to be clear. Uh -huh. I, I'm aware of that. And they're going to find their racket. But if you legalize drugs is what you're saying, they're just going to move to something new and that's going to be the source of violence. So you're just... You're, you're no, creating no, a bigger problem. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying they're going to new, move to something new. There's still tons of marijuana being smuggled yes. in the United States. Yes, you know, There's still tons of... Problem. And yeah. then what happens is... and and. Let's take marijuana out of the equation here in regards to the legalization because that train has left the station a long time ago. It's, it's legal. And I embrace that and I say, okay, celebrate it, do whatever you got to do. I don't smoke weed, but then again- I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't smoke weed, but I don't care if you do. Right. It's as legal as an ice cream sandwich. You know, just whatever. It's not part of the conversation anymore. I'm talking about cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and some of the mm. other drugs. We'd create, if you legalize cocaine, 
heroin and methamphetamine, the addictive natures of those drugs. Yeah. Imagine what society would becoming become like. I have a theory. It's called the M M&M and M theory. Do you like M and M's? I like M and M's. I've been in your house. You have a beautiful office here. I don't see any M and M's around here. I'm not. You know, my great grandmother, when I was very little, she would keep a. a a cup of M&Ms on every table. And exactly. She was the what last would happen? I knew who did that. And what was what would happen when you went there? I'd eat fucking all of them. You'd eat them all. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's what I call the availability. But there are some people mm. that wouldn't eat them all. Mm. But it's the it's it's what I call the M&M theory. Availability equals consumption. The more things are available, the more subsections of society will consume. Of that group, those that consume, some of them will have that addictive gene and become addicted to cocaine, methamphetamine, or heroin. But remember I said I don't think there's a way to arrest our way out of the situation, and I don't believe legalizing drugs. I still believe in what uh, is a 360 approach to look at it all the way around, and I created an acronym, and the acronym is PETER. It stands for Prevention, Enforcement, Treatment, Education, and Recovery. So... That's the way I look at it, and I, I think a lot differently than a lot of DEA agents as well, and uh, that's one of the reasons I think why I was so successful, and that I have the theory and that in order to be a successful law enforcement leader, a success, a successful cop, and a successful detective, you sometimes have to have the ability to think outside the, and what do you say? Think outside the what? The box. I, you say the box. I say think outside the badge. Think a little bit differently. Mm. Don't think like a traditional cop all the time. You catch a guy with a small amount of heroin, maybe he doesn't need to go to jail. Maybe he needs to go to rehab immediately. Or maybe you defer and you don't charge him with a felony mm. and things of that nature. Yeah. Or think outside the badge. Yeah. How are you going to attack problems differently? Yes. How are you going to find fugitives differently? How are you going to do this differently? And that's, 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 great to, that's great to hear you say that. Oh, uh, you, absolutely. You don't hear that a lot from, yeah. from guys that come from a position like yours. It's a little bit more... You know, well, by the book. Well, it's it's called, they call it a drug war, and there's a reason for it being a war, and that is it kills. Drugs and alcohol have killed more people than all the world wars combined. Yes, and there, because, but there's a question. So alcohol is legal. Exactly. Now, what it sounds like to me, and this I, this might be very fair, by the way, but... You have different, it's like in your mind, and I probably agree with you, you have different grades on it. So as an example, yeah, I've used someone drinking and someone using heroin as two very, very different things, right? Like the level of the damage that can do to you, Absolutely. right? So you're kind of separating out, like you look at alcohol and weed and where that is, and then you say, okay, but to use your exact terms, cocaine, methamphetamines, and I think heroin is what yeah, you said. Yeah, do those much. opioids. Okay. So those are the ones where you're like, when we're having this overall conversation of legalization, I think you were saying availability is going to equal use. Availability equals consumption. That's the M&M theory. Mm -hmm. Your grandmother subscribed great -grandmother, to it. Yeah. Great-grandmother subscribed to it in a certain way. Um, a lot of people want to make the comparisons, alcohol, marijuana. And a lot of times when I've given speeches, I say, I'm glad you bring that up. Alcohol is legal. Look at how many millions of people have died because of it. But mm -hmm. you want to make the comparison, we'll continue. Nine out of 10 people who drink don't drink to get high. It's a social thing. They drink one drink. Mm -hmm. They have a beer after they mow the lawn. They have a drink at dinner, whatever the case may be. So one out of 10, nine out of 10 people don't have a problem. And look at all the devastation it's caused already. When yeah. It's one out of 10. Weed. Nine out of ten people who smoke it normally smoke it to get high. I'm, I'm yeah. not, yeah, and, and that's that's the objective. So my point is, they're very vastly different in and of themselves as well. But remember what I said a couple of minutes ago. Let's not go down that. We're not going to change anyone's minds, and mm. and that's the other thing about TikTok that I and and some of these other questions that I have to answer in public. What's your if, TikTok page, by the way? It's called the DEA guy. It's a great page. People should go follow it. But the we'll, we'll talk about it more guy. later. Just want to make so, sure we got that. So, and maybe one of the one of these days on TikTok on the DEA guy. That's my third time for those of you counting. <laughs> and some of you are right now going, oh, do that, do that. Go follow. Okay. Go follow. Um, but uh, when I get to ask this question, I already know what they think. Yeah. And that is, what do you think about legalization? I can tell you. I've been asked that question a thousand times. I can tell you on one hand 
there's only less than five people that were against legalization that asked that question. So the nature of the question and my reading of people over the years is when they ask that question, I already know what their answer is. And no matter what I say, I'm not going to change their mind. But they say, hey, I got a DEA agent here. You know, I got this guy, et cetera, et cetera, that knows all about the drug mm-hmm. world, the drug culture and all that. And those are the same people that hadn't heard me speak about prevention, enforcement, treatment, education, and recovery. Well, I think a lot of it is people look at the failures of those systems in the past, the failures of the quote-unquote war on drugs and what that did. I'm I'm not talking specifically about the DEA right now. I'm saying like in general, when you look at it across society, the the failure of – of the rehab industry, which is really, you know, I'm glad for some people it works, but it has something along the lines of a 3% success ratio. Look, I, I worked in finance. I was around some of the, the financing of some of those types of places and saw some things that I, or heard some things, I should say, that, that I can never really unhear as far as some of the corruption that goes into that. And I think people get frustrated with that and they want to, they want to then like everything else in the world, every reaction gets an equal but opposite reaction. And so they want the total opposite. To be clear on counting on your hands with the people who are asking that question, I don't have an opinion yet on on what that is. My if if you ask me right now, I would say no, I'm not going to legalize everything. But I would say like how do we look at like your availability problem, for example? Cuz I'll tell you, nothing shocked me at college except one thing. And that, that, was, that was great that like I went to college and it was kind of exactly what I expected. I had a good time, but it was like high school, but on steroids, everyone had fun, great experience. The one thing that shocked me though, that I did not see coming was that the number of people who use blow in college was stunning. By my senior year, it was used, and I would use this word excessively more than marijuana. And I was like, you know, my line was always simple. I was like, can kill me, right? So if I had a line of like what I was going to do, I, I always fell on on the side of, all right, I'm going to drink some alcohol and, and smoke some weed because I got to drink a lot of alcohol for that to kill me and weed's not going to kill me. Coke was always something like, oh, I don't want to be Len Bias. You know, that shit can stop your heart. And it also looked like a really, really good time. And I'm like, I feel like I would like that a lot. So I never did it. But the number of people who did was shocking. So when we're talking about availability with black markets and we're going to be laying out where this all comes from no, and how no, you are intricately no, tied to that. Absolutely. It's like, no question about it. How so, do you stop that? Well, just imagine, just imagine if it was available down at the local packy liquor store for you to buy, hey, let's go down and buy an ounce of Coke. It's, the price is only $90 today. They're having a special or it's a two, two ounces for one or whatever. <laughs> Imagine all those college kids, et cetera, et cetera. And some of them end up like Lenny Bias or some of them end up like John Belushi or some of the other folks. But my point is this, and I like the parallels that you gave when you talked about cocaine over here and you talked about marijuana and alcohol over here. And then you used the word, I think, two or three times, line. Yeah. No a pun line, intended. A line, I got yeah. it, I got it, I got it. But that's exactly where I thought you might be going to when no, you had no, that. No, when no, you no. had that there. No. So no pun intended, good play on words. So we could talk the drug legalization and all that stuff. Some people say, oh, you know, you're just a hardcore DEA agent. Look at him, the guy, you know, he's got his head shaved. You do whatever, look like a cop. I got to tell you, Whatever the Ken. case may be. You should have seen me when I was younger. As I told you earlier, I didn't look like one. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and so my, my point is I do, I do come up with life experiences that show me a lot of different things. Mm. I will never believe that cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine and some of the other drugs should be legalized. Marijuana fought that fight. Government fought it. Everybody else fought it, whatever the case may be. It's over there. Put it in the past. When you have your 13, when you're really pro this and you have your 13 year old daughter come home Mm. stoned three days in a row and she says, Yeah, I was smoking weed at school, age changes opinions sometimes. Yes, it does. It does. Like, what do you mean you're smoking weed? Well, dad, I heard you and mom talk about it. You said it should be legal. Some people use it for medicine. There's a million excuses. And of that 13 year old daughter, some will. Dad will punish her and she'll never smoke weed again. Some will continue to smoke weed and some will end up graduating and 
doing some other drugs and move on, et cetera, et cetera. And some will end up growing up to become Supreme Court justices someday. Yes. Yeah. Who knows what the DNA in that specific kid is. But my point is when you've seen so many things and and let's get back to DEA and enforcement in yeah. a minute, but I want to tell you this really quickly. The biggest pro- opponents of legalizing of marijuana are former marijuana users that go to NA, Narcotics Anonymous, and AA meetings. Mm-hmm. You go in there and you talk to them and they're like, dude, you wouldn't believe it. They say it's not addictive. Well, it might not be physically addictive, but psychologically, that's all I ever did. I woke up, sure. I smoked weed all sure. day long. I was, I lost yes. my family, I lost my kids, I lost my job because I was a stoner the entire time. Those are the people that 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 the that the monster, the Godzilla, grabbed them and and squeezed them and shook them and said, you know, I'm I'm. I'm your bitch now. Yep. I, you know, and, and, I, I don't think anything's 100%. Ken. Yeah, and exactly. I think, that, I think there's always going to be, sure. like, it, with any type of substance, I don't care what it is, there will be people who go down the wrong way with that. I know Absolutely. people, like, when you give me that example, I can think of people in my head that I knew in college that I thought to myself, within a week of knowing them, you know, weed is not good for you. Yeah. Like, you but, really you know, shouldn't do that. It's it's the society we live in, and everybody's yeah. got a, an opinion, and I've got mine, you've got yours, yeah. and some of your listeners will have them. But that's just one of the things. I mean, if, if you want to legalize the hardcore drugs because you think it would take the criminal element out of it, you know, sorry, you're wrong. You've you've had maybe a drink and you think that's a great idea. It's not if you really study it. Let's get back to some really Let's get back cool stuff, stuff yeah. dealing with, as opposed to helping people at NA meetings, AA meetings, <laughs> and things like that. Which well, is, no, it's which good is, context, though, which is really so people can see tr- how you think. The truth of the matter, it is really cool. When you mentor somebody that had a drug problem, they later on come up and say to you, you saved my life. Um, that's a cool feeling as and well. And you've done that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. Uh, my wife and I, we like to mentor uh, young people. And for some reason, some of these stray pups gravitate towards me because as hardcore as you can be, and and you know my background, and you know some of the violence and some of the things I've seen, that the key elements of being a good person, in my opinion, is being compassionate mm-hmm. towards your fellow human being. I might have told you a couple of stories, but... There was another one. Um, my partner and I arrested a guy in uh, in South America. He had murdered 30-some people in Puerto Rico. And when we were taking him to the plane to extradite him and send him back, uh, we didn't extradite him. We expelled him from Colombia, as a matter of fact. You what? Expelled him. Expulsion. It's it's oh. like the country kicks oh, you right. out. Yeah. Yeah. You get expelled. Yep. Um, we took him and we got him a hamburger on a drive through on the way <laughs> to take him. And uh, just because we knew he'd be sitting in a Puerto Rican prison probably for the rest of his life. That is unless he escaped somehow. And like like that other guy I was telling you about, we arrested that escaped with a helicopter from the Puerto Rican prison. Mm. But my point is compassion. You got to be compassionate, in my opinion, besides, besides knowing that you're going into violence and you're in a very dangerous field, et cetera, et cetera. There's times in your life where you can find compassion for people. And, and uh, I tell this story story briefly about a guy that I arrested that kidnapped and shot two agents. And as we're getting ready to put him on the plane, I said to him, you're going to be in handcuffs on a plane for the next five hours. Do you need to use the restroom or do you need any water? And I we videotaped this whole thing. And later on, I was showing it to my mom. <laughs> God bless her. I mean, it was just, it was the video that we took because we never wanted him to accuse us of, of harming him, like mm. putting the handcuffs on too tight. He had kidnapped and shot two agents. So, is that some... the guy you carved the initials into the handcuffs? Exactly mm. into the handcuffs because I went on a. His name was Rene Benitez. I was on a six-year quest to capture this guy. But my my point is, my mother watched this video I, when I went on vacation. I said, "Hey, mom, you want to see the video? The guy we arrested. I'll show you what he looks like." You know, it wasn't any confidential document or anything like that. And she looked at it and she said, "Sometimes I can't figure out if you." play the part of Rambo or Mother Teresa. <laughs> this guy kidnapped and shot two agents and left them for dead in the jungles of Colombia and you're offering them a glass of water? And my point is, just be compassionate towards people. Well, as a broad question from your entire career on that exact kind of wavelength, did you ever find yourself 
feeling Do you ever find yourself feeling empathy for some of the really bad guys once you got them and really learned about where they came from and how they ended up being this monster? Not really, because there are a lot of people that came up the same way, the mm -hmm. same way that didn't become monsters. They became laborers, they went to school, they construction workers, whatever, they led a life, they had two or three kids, they didn't leave a life of violence and crime and not really not much empathy towards major drug dealers especially the ones that walk down the path of violence that would eliminate the competition through homicides i told mm -hmm. you earlier about the fbi top 10 fugitive that i arrested named armando garcia i don't think you told me about that one he's a guy i told you about his, his name was scarface he was on the fbi top 10 most wanted list he was a former cop in miami that ripped off drug dealers and several of them died they they started to steal drugs from a guys on a drug on a uh, drug shipment vessel in um, on the Miami River, and uh, one of the intercoastals. And uh, some of the bad guys jumped overboard. And they all died. And uh, this guy, whose name was Armando Garcia, it was a Miami River cop, the police officer. But my point is, when we arrested him, spoke to him, just like you and I are speaking to him. He looked at me and he said, do you know who won the game the other night, the Monday night football game? <laughs> and here he is hiding out in Columbia, top 10 FBI most wanted fugitive, asking a DEA agent that helped just arrest him with the uh, Colombian authorities and, and my <laughs> partner, Chris. And he's saying, or no, my partner, Dirk, on that one. And he's saying, like, uh, who won the Monday night football game? You know, and but my point is I was kind to him. Yeah. You can be compassionate and kind to the John Wayne Gacy's of the world mm. or to whomever. You're separating compassion and empathy here. I understand that. Exactly. Yeah. Where where I but but never give them excuses as to why you yeah, ended up yes, like this. Yes. You can hear the story. I guess the best way to put it is it may explain it, but it's not an excuse. Yeah, excuses it, it, and I see what you're saying and I think I think you are definitely at least mostly right i there, there's one story i've told it before i think it's been a while though but i always think about this one because i, I do think sometimes there's circumstance with things my a, a really really close friend of mine from college josh was actually on this show number 54 he he grew up in the bronx and he's a really really smart guy and so he also had the not usual scenario where he had two great parents at home you know, he grew up in the projects and obviously that's something where we see a pattern where there's one parent and they always work or something like that. And both of his parents are awesome and, and raised him really well. But in addition to that, you know, he was able to get into some amazing programs that basically, you know, he worked his way up and, and is now an extremely successful guy and, and got a great education out of it. But he was able to get out of the regular school system and get into like the honors type school system. Accelerated. Which, AP. Yes. Yes. And then eventually that got him to be able to go to school outside the city before college. So when he got into the program that sent him away to high school, he comes back home. He's like 14 years old, I think it was. He comes back home to the Bronx and he's coming up on the corner and he sees one of his buddies he grew up with who just wasn't as smart as him on the corner and he knows what it is you know the kid's strapped and he's he's working for for the neighborhood business somebody and i i give the friend a lot of credit for this the friend saw him and he wasn't like excited to see him but he smiled walked up to him dabbed him up and he said you doing good and josh was like yeah 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 it's going well and he goes listen to me you're going to walk across that street and from now on you walk on that side of the street you need to keep doing what you're doing this is not for you and he walked across, they kind of looked at each other, they had a moment and there was an understanding there. And I look at that and I said, now that 14 year old, 15 year old friend, who's gonna end up in that life, it appears, unless something drastically changes. There's a number one, a ton of humanity to him, a ton of care to him, and also perhaps a lack of an opportunity that Josh did. And it's not to say, oh, therefore, whatever happens to him next and whatever decisions he as a human being makes are excused. But it does, that story always adds a lot of nuance to me where it's like, it's not like that kid was doing things wrong. Josh was just 
gifted and did a lot of extra things right. Mm-hmm. And also his parents deserve a ton of credit too. You know, how do you rectify that? It's hard for me. It's it's very like that as as a lay person, someone who hasn't sat in your seat, especially. So you know you have a different perspective on this. That's probably more qualified, definitely more qualified. For me, just as a human, I, that that's hard for me. Well, there's um, when you hear that story, it's the kind of story that country songs and other songs are built on. Sometimes, yes. like there was um, there's a song by. Um, um, Lou Rawls, it's called The Windy City, and it talks about getting out of the city, getting out of Chicago, mm. where he went out and got himself a job and he moved on. It's a great song, by the way, from the 60s. There's another song, I think the author's name is Don Williams, they called him The Gentle Giant, and he talked about leaving his country home where his best friends burn themselves up on bourbon and speed. And he says, I learned to talk like a man on the six o'clock news. So about people escaping that area. But when it comes to the empathy, there's a lot to do with understanding. And there's a lot of programs out there, unfortunately, there's just not enough of them to try and help the people like Josh, episode number 54, who got out, you know? So, um, but when it comes to some of these criminals, as we were talking earlier on the airport ride over here, I've looked into the eyes of Eric Rudolph, the Olympic Park bomber, and I've spoke to him. He's the underwear before. bomber? No, a, 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 Eric. Oh, oh, Eric Rudolph, 96 bomber. Yeah, right. Eric okay. Rudolph, Eric Rudolph, the Olympic Park bomber. I've looked at him and I've spoke to him in a courtroom and I've seen the evil in his eye and I've heard the evil in his voice. You talked about the underwear bomber who's got a name that 99% of the people could not even pronounce, so I won't even bother with it right now. (laughs) But I looked at him dead straight in the eye on Christmas Day, December uh, 25th, 2009, and I saw the representation of evil in his eye, and there was no Mm. way I was going to ever change this guy who was indoctrinated into wanting to blow up airplanes so he could kill as many Americans as as he could. But I saw him. I spoke to him. And then speaking to the FBI top 10 fugitive, when we arrested him, or Rene Benitez, who kidnapped the two federal agents in 1982. And a lot of these people that I've seen, and, and for example, Giovanni Littlejohn, the guy that killed the state trooper, looked at him in a courtroom, and he just looked at me, and there was something just vacant, that he mm. just didn't understand the ramifications. All he knew was he was going to go to prison for life when he was found guilty, and it was just a formality. I mean, we knew he did it. It's just a matter of going through the courtroom right. process. So you see some of these people, and on a final note, what I'll add on that whole topic is every now and then, which happens a lot, meaning if you're involved in a lot of things, every now and then means a lot of situations. How many times have I actually had a guy say to me, you know, that I've arrested, whether it be with a kilo of cocaine or whatever, 10 kilos of coke or whatever, or we arrested him after we worked undercover against him or whatever, how many of them have said, you know, I always wanted to be a cop when I was younger. I always wanted to become a police officer. And it takes me back to my childhood where there was there was that line mm. that I speak about yeah. where I was doing juvenile delinquent stuff, just yeah. crazy things that kids do. And then I met a police officer who put me on the right track and got me interested. So mentors, role models, and heroes. There you have it, right there. there And those guys never had it. The ones that said to me, I always wanted to be a cop, you know? And now that that day, that train left the station a long time ago when you decided to rob that liquor store or when you decided to start selling Coke or when you decided to do whatever. So anyway. And one action builds on to all the others. Exactly. That's how it goes. So it's been a, uh, um, we can now break and say like Kumbaya and all that stuff, all the, there's a lot of touchy feely stuff that we talked about, compassion and, and, and morals and seeing people have destroyed themselves and then people have picked themselves up out of the ashes like Josh was on his way to, to, to not being able to cross the street to some of the other folks. But when it comes to the world of drugs and narcotics, Drugs and drug dealers are just like arms dealers. They're just like fencers Mm. or whatever. It's crime. You're selling something that you're getting to somebody else who needs it or wants it, and you're making a profit, and you're doing it illegally for whatever reason it's illegal. And the ramifications of not paying the bookie, 
The ramifications of not paying the drug dealer. Right. The ramifications of not paying the person for that stolen steak truck that you got that's filled with fish, frozen fish, that because it was hijacked coming from uh, Saugus, Mass, or whatever the case may be, uh, all the way over to New Jersey. The ramifications are exactly if the camera could look at you. Yeah, I was oh, just it doing is that. looking I was at doing you. There you right go. Here, yeah. It's boom, boom, boom. You yep. know, so that little thing is not like just straight out of Compton. That's wherever it may be. It could be Barry Seal getting killed in Louisiana. It could be whatever. Mm. What's the old saying? Snitches get stitches. Yes. If you, it all leads the criminal behavior towards violence yes. if the rules aren't played. But there's one rule that should never be broken, and that is. You don't kill cops, and cops don't kill you unless it's a violent confrontation. Mm. My point is, every now and then, in this world we live in right now, obviously, with social media and the news, we've seen a lot of tragedies on, on the news where some cops have acted horribly. Yes. Absolutely horrible. And the person that hates a bad cop the most is a good cop. Yes. And for your listeners, please remember that quote because you can tell that to anyone. I can guarantee you the people that hate bad cops are good cops more than anyone. But my point is when a bad guy crosses the line and kills an agent, like we had Kiki Camarain in Mexico, yeah. or we had the agent, two agents that I talked about, Renee Benitez kidnapped and shot. Their names are Kelly McCullough and Charlie Martinez. Kiki's the, was interesting. Yeah. That was a little different, but yeah. Well, the, the two agents that I just mentioned miraculously lived, and it's a whole fascinating story that's documented out there in numerous different websites and uh, TV channels where I've been interviewed on it. Uh, but then there's other ones where you, if you just random, you pull over a cop, and or I mean you pull over a bad guy and the cop shoots, shoots a bad guy. I'm sorry, the bad guy shoots the cop out of the blue. Mm. It's it's just rules that you don't want to violate. Right. Cops don't randomly kill bad guys. We don't live in the, the star chamber where we seek out and we have vigilante cops out there. Do we have some bad cops? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And fortunately, it's being brought to light, and slowly but surely, the recruiting processes will change and other things will occur, and we'll make sure that we hopefully rid Rid communities of bad cops. Yeah. yeah. But you talked about crime and these people who went the wrong way, compassion and ethics. My point is all of those people that ended up getting into a life of crime that's moving dope, moving fencing, stolen property, high stakes gambling. There's an example. You legalize gambling. They still got they still got illegal gambling people all over the country. People love gambling. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's a service. But my point is, boom, boom, boom. Someone's going to get taken out mm. if you don't pay the price. So, fair, and and that's that's a really fair point. And like like you said, we could go on and on and on about that. But I really want to talk about your career and, and continue that conversation. So to your viewers who didn't like this part of the segment, <laughs> tell your friends if they watch it, they can fast forward to a certain time so we can get away from all the oh, policy and no, changes, people, et cetera, et cetera, people et cetera. Liked et cetera. It. Listen, there, are there people out there who when they hear something they disagree with will flip out and do those people tend to find them their way into YouTube comment sections? Yes, but a lot of people, a lot more than we think and would think looking at social media these days, like hearing things that you know if it's not presented like a dick or something like that that don't necessarily jive with their worldview but give them some sort of perspective that they didn't understand that you know maybe they don't have to agree with it but they can appreciate why that person has it i mean that's my favorite thing about this show that's why i don't mind having a silo there where we go back and forth on some of that because these are look if these were easy questions you know we wouldn't have these problems exactly but i do request just keep your hands where i can see them at all times okay I don't know if I've done that this whole time. Okay. So I've noticed. You, know, you, you right? want them on the table? Yeah, like I just this? want to make sure I can see your hands at all I'm times. I'm loaded right underneath the table. You heard what I said, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do but, not reach under the table. <laughs> um, but, you know, we talked about the level of criminal. And you, you were talking about Pablo Escobar in the very beginning. And we're going to mm -hmm. obviously talk about him. We're right going now, there. I gave an interview to CNN. Um, Mark Bowden wrote the book Killing Pablo. It's a very good book. Yeah. Um, he was also the gentleman that wrote uh, Black Hawk Down. Yes. Where they yes. made the movie out of Black Hawk Down. He's, uh, he's a, uh, he used to be a reporter, I believe, out of the Philadelphia Examiner. 
Um, and right he that. turned me on to another reporter by the name of David Zacchino, who worked for the Philadelphia Examiner as well, that wrote a story about those two agents that were kidnapped. But back to back to Killing Pablo and Mark Bowden's book, CNN did a special on Killing Pablo many, many years ago in the early 2000s. And I was a lead interviewer for DEA. And one of my comments at the very beginning, which ended up being the comment that they used in the promo advertising and all the advertising of several weeks before. And that is, in my opinion, Pablo Escobar was the largest criminal the world has ever seen or will ever see. And then I said in the interview, if Al Capone was alive during the time that Pablo Escobar was around, Al Capone could have probably been a driver, maybe a bodyguard for Pablo Escobar. <laughs> Meaning Pablo Escobar was responsible for thousands of police officers being murdered. Yeah. yeah. And ultimately Al Capone goes down for income tax evasion. Right. You know, but he didn't nearly, I mean, you could count the time probably less on one hand that police officers were killed because of Al Capone, but you can count the times that you can count the times you need a calculator to count the times of how many police officers were killed. Thousands of them. As yeah. well as prosecutors oh, and yeah. judges, people you in, name in it. the government. It's crazy. And Pablo Escobar blew up an airplane, killing over a hundred people to kill one person on the he didn't airplane. Care. He didn't. On the Bianca airplane. He's. It's one of those things where you can be a huge fan of the stories and stuff like that because it happened, you know, and it's wild to think about. As I am, but you know, something that shouldn't get lost in it is that any any cultural rewritten tales about pablo escobar being robin hood or being you know having a few good things yeah, totally he, false because anything he did that was remotely good like buying uh, building some neighborhoods and shit like that building neighborhoods building hospitals soccer was, fields things of that nature there was always a cost to it yeah how many people died to yeah. get the money to get to that point exactly or what did he do with the people who then he viewed as owing them a favor and that's right? true i mean it, it was the, it was the guy was the ultimate extortionist and i i don't i don't think you're wrong i i think that's yeah i'm trying to go through like my head of like famous criminals especially over like the last hundred years i i, I think you're probably right he was he was the guy well he had he also created alliances and a network of people that would support him most of them were poor for example taxi cab drivers in columbia mm. people of that nature that would be informants not for the government, but for Pablo Escobar. Yeah. So they would notify him, hey, there's these two gringos that showed up and <laughs> or whatever the case may be. It, it could I feel bad if it was like the petroleum businessman that was going down to Medellin to put together some deal with British Petroleum or something like that. But so he did that. He created those alliances and um it's and it was a great marketing tool for him. It allowed him to stay alive, it allowed him to get information, yeah. it built his network. And people to this day will go to his gravesite. People to this day will say he was like a Robin Hood that saved so many people, but he left thousands and thousands of widows in his wake. Yes. And there's no question about it. But, you know, by it, it was brilliant, the whole thing with taxi cabs, you know, to get the drivers, they all would receive a little bit of a stipend from, <laughs> from some of the people that worked for Pablo Escobar. And uh, it reminds me of like, for example, there's a restaurant in Boston called, I think they closed by now. It's called Anthony's Pier 4. It was okay. a huge, it was a huge seafood place. Maybe it's still around. But uh, every year, one, one day out of the year, they closed the restaurant and every taxi cab driver in Boston would get free meals, a free lobster. Oh, that's they cool. could bring themselves and their family in. They pull in their taxi cab. They have dinner at Anthony's Pier 4. It would cost wow. 50, 60 bucks. Who knows? Um and why did they do that? It's a great marketing tool. Because anybody that got off the airplane, got in a taxi yeah. cab, hey, where's a good place to eat? Oh, go to Anthony's Pier 4. Yeah. Bada bing, bada boom. They they did it. They did it for years. Now, in this advent of Uber and Lyft and things like that, I don't think they do that anymore. But uh, so I, I think of that when it comes to the taxi cabs, when I think of the parallels to Pablo Escobar utilizing the taxi cabs as a international or a inner city network of just giving information. Yeah, they're you know? they're basically positioned spies who just need a reason to spy, give them a little money. Yeah, if it was today, they'd probably have an app. You know, the app would be, 
Now, the app would be, you know, click on, if you work for Pablo Escobar, press this button and, hey, two gringos just showed up on the plane in Medellin and, you know. I can't, I, I can probably safely say that a guy like Escobar at the level that he existed today, even, even in other countries, even in pick out other third world countries around the world, I, I don't think he could ever exist at that level. Well, he'd I, have to be. He'd have to be completely government backed, like oh, a powerful government. Well, well, that's in in the statement that I talked to you about in that Killing Pablo uh, TV special on CNN. The lead in statement that everybody heard me say was the world. The world will never see a larger criminal than Pablo Escobar, and they cut it off right there. But the continuation of my sentence was. Unless it's a political criminal of some sort. <laughs> my, my point being, we considered people like Saddam Hussein, uh, Idi Amin, and dictatorships, things of that nature. Some of those people could grow so large that and amass the amount of wealth and power and dictatorship yes. and violence and killing thousands of people. You you go to some of these places, uh, Miramar, places like that, and, and you look at the violence associated with their political leaders. And I don't claim to be an expert on that. I read the paper like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever paper exists anymore. But they're back. To, the point is they're ahead of a government. I didn't stop you earlier when you said that, and I'm glad I didn't because now you're bringing it up yourself. But I was going to I was going to ask you when you were talking about the level and height of Escobar's crimes, I was going to ask you, does that exclude like world leaders? Manuel, Manuel you know? Noriega. Right. Um, I mean, Adolf um, Hitler, like he can't, com you know what I mean? Like uh, they have a whole government behind them. Exactly. <laughs> it's crazy. Exactly. But this stems from what you said a couple minutes ago. And that is, there will never be a drug dealer as powerful as Pablo yeah. Escobar again, yeah. or a criminal that large. It just won't happen. Do they have their, in Thailand, they've got the opioid mover, or the opium movers and shakers and things of that nature, which is a whole fascinating area. If you go out to the, the area of where, what we used to call the Golden Triangle, it was Burma, Laos, and Thailand, and... Um, but now Burma has become Miramar. But my point is, they have their their whole multi multi millionaires. But Pablo really capitalized it on it. And a real simple book to read to learn a lot more about Pablo and how he thought. We spoke about it earlier, and I was fascinated because I went into this the son's th book exactly. Yeah. I went into reading this book thinking, <clears throat> I'm not going to learn much about Pablo Escobar. But it was a book called Pablo Escobar, My Father, by his son, Juan Pablo Escobar. So here this kid is at 16 years old that I followed to Germany. <laughs> and you were I, on a plane ride yeah, with. <laughs> but so interesting. In the book, I was so excited to get the book, too, just to see what he described as that trip was basically a paragraph. It was a paragraph, his trip to Germany. That's all you got. That's all I got out of his book, <laughs> where I could have written a whole chapter for him. He didn't, and say, I, he didn't say this fucking DEA agent six rows ahead taking yeah, but pictures because of me he, the whole he time. Had no, he had no clue. But, you know, like you saw earlier, some of the pictures that I had, the pictures of his passport that was confiscated by the Germans that I took pictures of in the restroom on the plane back to Colombia. Oh, when do you I, have those right now? Yeah, I've got them here somewhere. Um, I'll, so, I'll take a look while you're talking. Um, in here. So I got you. what happened was on that airplane, I'm taking pictures of his passports and where he's been and all that stuff. And I'm thinking to myself mm -hmm. that, uh, okay, we might never get a chance to photograph these things again. So I'm taking pictures of these things in the bathroom. And then I slip them back to the German uh, soldier or German police officer that was on board the plane transporting the Escobars back or escorting them back. But my point is this, when I walked out of the bathroom with the passports in my pocket after I took the photographs, who was waiting in line at the bathroom when I opened the door face to face the with 16 year old Juan Pablo. And I'm saying, Oh, excuse me. And I kind of <laughs> walked by and I'm thinking if he only knew, but let's get back to the book. Yeah. My point is you learned a lot about Pablo Escobar in that book. One might say, why am I doing a promo for a book by by Pablo Escobar's son. And it's not because I am saying like, it's not because it's on my TikTok page store. 
So, and it is, <laughs> but my, my, my point is, my point is, it was fascinating reading. Why? Uh, Why okay. was it fascinating? Because you learn more about Pablo Escobar as the man, yes. the father, and you hear all the lessons that he taught his son. But I also learned that near the end, the Escobar's family weren't living in a life of luxury. They, mm. The son and his daughter and his wife, they were going from apartment to apartment hiding they were, they were being persecuted because people wanted to get to them, kill them, so they could get even with Pablo Escobar. Yeah. But you hear all these stories, but you also hear Juan Pablo talk about the lessons that his father taught him about a lot of different things. And you learn more about Pablo as a person. Like and some of his nuances, like he never wore a tie. His shirt would always be buttoned down, un unbuttoned down to the third button. He took three hour showers or baths. Three hours. Yeah, and that he very rarely he only saw his father drunk one time in his entire life. His father loved to smoke weed though, and uh, see that's the thing. If you smoke weed, you become a member of the Medellin <laughs> cartel. <laughs> Yeah, to work that yeah. one. Oh, no, all kidding aside, but um, oh, did you lose? By the way, just this thing right here on yeah, the on the go. headphones. Just go like that, and you'll be able to hear it. Okay, yeah. are we back? Yeah, we're good. And and that was obviously a joke. But my my point is because that's a joke taken off of um, reefer madness from the movie the government made in the 30s that show if you smoke marijuana you become a zombie oh, yeah. and you walk around yeah. and all that so th and that was that was my little tongue in cheek uh, example of how ridiculous the movie reefer madness yeah. was as the propaganda by the government many, many years ago all that, exactly yeah. so um that was before anslinger but uh was before him uh, yeah cuz it was in the 30s or 40s, Reefer Madness. But with that being said, um, the book, it's, it's an incredible book because it also talks about after Pablo died, how the Cali cartel utilized their power and went to Mrs. Escobar and said, we're going to kill your son and we're going to kill you probably because your father costs us tens of millions of dollars. So she had to work out with numerous drug dealers and drug barons throughout the country saying, take this building, it belonged to my father right. or my husband, take this. Lost he, gave, he gave yeah. a helicopter away, yeah. all these things that it were bought with drug gains, but they all went to members of the Cali cartel. It's amazing how he went from this most powerful figure in the world to you know a, a scrambling rat at the end of his life, and then his family was left with nothing. And not that that's not exactly really with how nothing. Gone, the Cali cartel said the Cali, and you're right pretty much nothing the Cali cartel said we're going to let him keep these two or three buildings because he gave those to his kids so when they finally made the nice decision they finally made the decision not to kill juan pablo and they tell the whole story in the book and juan pablo at that time is like 17 years yeah, old because yeah. they were concerned that he was he he talks about after his father was killed he got a call from a reporter five minutes after his father was killed. And he said something to the effect, I'm going to kill every one of those motherfuckers that right. were ever involved with harming my father. I'm going to hunt them down and kill them. It was something to that extent. Yeah. And he said, the minute I uttered those words, I regretted it. And I regret it now for the rest of my life. Because very shortly after that, I thought, I can go down two paths. Yeah. I can either A, be like my father, or B, a member of the community, et cetera, et cetera. And they tell this story about how he becomes... And the truth is, I would love to have a cup of coffee with the guy. I'll bet you, yeah. No, I would love to have a cup, cup of coffee with Juan Pablo and just say, I read your book, and then this is the compassionate side. I got it. Yeah. You you raised by Pablo Escobar. Yeah. If you became a drug baron, ruthless, murdering criminal, I wouldn't excuse it, but it might explain it. Yes. It might explain it, but you're to be commended because of the path that you did take. Yeah. And uh, and so the book was fascinating, learned a lot about Pablo, and I would recommend it to people if they were interested in learning more about Pablo as a person. Because obviously, let's face it, Pablo's not writing his autobiography. No, he's pretty dead. Yeah. There's a few pictures in there that kind of prove that. We'll, yeah. We'll get to yeah, that. We'll <laughs> but wait, back to your career just before in the build up to Columbia. So you said you joined the DEA, was it 1983? Or? I became an agent in September of 1984. 84. Okay. Yeah, and I spent almost a quarter of a decade, almost 25 years. So when you went in there, because you went to Columbia in 88, right? 
I got to Columbia January of 1989. Okay. So in the four or five years, four and a half years, whatever it was leading up to that, were you right away like a case agent, like mm-hmm. making, mm-hmm. making case, like what kinds of things were you doing? Well, I went to the academy in Glencoe, Georgia. It was at that time, uh, the, what's called FLETEC, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. That's where DEA had their training academy. A few years later, a couple of years later, they moved to um, uh, the F Quantico at FBI, and they built their own DEA academy. Especially, it's a pretty elite place. It's it shares more or less the same property location as the FBI, so we can share assets like Hogan's Alley and some of the other places. So, I uh, I went to the DEA academy and I graduated and moved back to Michigan. I got assigned to Detroit, Michigan, my hometown. Oh, really? Yep. Not a lot of people get assigned to their hometown outside of uh, out of the academy, but I did. Why? Because not a lot of people wanted to go to Detroit, <laughs> and I did because it was home. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. I ended up going to Detroit, and I spent four years there. And during that time, I worked on several different programs. One of them, uh, in the beginning, I was you know I was a young rookie agent, and so I was assigned to a senior agent, and I would get coffee for him and help write his reports, and you know do surveillance on his cases. And slowly but surely, I became my own agent. Mm. You know, in order to get a promotion, you have to work undercover. I was reviewing some notes. I saw, saw the memorandum that said he's entitled to his next promotion as he has performed in an undercover capacity. I almost laugh about that at this day. But back then, it was like, that was important. Mm. So I was buying heroin in the ghettos of Detroit. And uh, as and let's face it, I didn't blend in, <laughs> but I was successful. I was successful. and uh, I how, would, remember, how would you do that? Like, uh, how, how do you pull that off? It was called Herman Gardens. It was this... It was this it was this complex that was the projects and uh i went in there and and i just said i'm i, I need some and i would need some dope I'm, I'm, my my brother's really sick he's sick and i just played up a story and this guy says if you're a cop i'm going to kill you and i had an informant with me who took me in there mm-hmm. uh, no agent does it alone yeah you are part of a team whether that team consists of informants or other agents or, and or both which is most likely the situation for example, the Pablo Escobar wasn't just two guys. It was a team of people. It was a small elite team of DEA folks, but it was a huge team as you start to expand out of Columbia National Police and all sorts of other intelligence agencies and as well as people coming in and helping. Um, so uh, it never happens without a team. So I go from buying a, a couple grams of heroin that parallel there was a couple grams of heroin to taking down Pablo Escobar. So that was about <laughs> as well, being involved on the team that took down Pablo Escobar. That's about as big yeah. of, uh, of, of differences that you can make. But I basically played off that I wasn't a heroin addict. My brother was sick and I was there trying to score for him. Mm. And so I remember going back to the office and they take you off for a drink on your very first undercover deal. And, and, uh, I had these black agents who said, "You went where?" And I said, <laughs> "I said I, I was in Herman Gardens, and yeah, I bought this. I bought the heroin. I'll and, take uh, you some time." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they go, "Are you?" And they're like, "You fucking kidding me?" And one 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 agent who just passed away a little while ago, his name is Baby Hayes. He died in Chicago. He was a very good undercover agent and a great guy. And uh, Baby Hayes says, "Man, that guy's got some balls." You <laughs> that he? And I I'm walking away, getting ready to go process my dope and put it in the you. It, Anytime you seize drugs or seize dope, there's always two agents present. Which when you're doing the seizure. When you're doing the seizure and when you're processing it, you're doing everything. Never does cash or dope ever end up being only in the possession of one agent. There's always two people. So that means there's two people stealing it for everyone following out at home. And that's what some of you people who watch late night TV, go to the movies and all that believe. But that is the exact reason why yeah. it's done that way. Yeah. So nobody can ever accuse you of corruption. And number two is it verifies in court one person's story versus and and the others. Mm. Like we we it's the chain of custody. It went you know, I, I initialed off on it on the scene. I put it in the trunk of the car. My car was followed by Agent Johnson, who followed Agent McGee to the office. We opened this trunk simultaneously, removed the duffel bag filled with cocaine, and transported it up to the upstairs where it was, you know, whether we videotape it or photograph it or whatever. So it eliminates the argument of corruption. Mm-hmm. Does it totally eliminate it? No, because we've had corrupt agents. Luckily, just very few. 
Very few. And I can tell a story or two about that another time. No, no, you can tell it now if you want. Um, But but I want to finish the analogy. So working undercover and and working in that area, that's how I started my my career in Detroit. And then um, then I was assigned to a... um, the airport for interdiction. I I had an accident. I broke my leg really bad, so I had problems walking. So they how'd you do that? I was playing fast pitch softball. I threw an I slid in the third base. Mm, yeah, I was tough. safe. For those of you <laughs> who wanted to know, I was safe. Um, but I had to have my right ankle rebuilt. And uh, when I was in rehab, um, this for, is in the eighties. Yeah, what they use duct tape. <laughs> Christ, you walk pretty good. Yeah, thank you. No, I I've I've done a lot of things since then. I, I, it doesn't impact me. But uh, anyway, so um, I was assigned to the airport interdiction team at Detroit Metropolitan Airport. Hold, hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. We'll sure. be right back. I just got to check the camera over there. Hold on one second. All right. All right. We're back now. I had one little camera problem, but I think we're good. So you were talking about how you broke your ankle and then... You got into something after doing the yeah the yeah 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 in Detroit so so it shattered my ankle just shattered it metal plate in it tendons rebuilt ligaments rebuilt you name it and uh, so they put me out at the airport which was which was interesting because you met a lot of drug dealers going back and forth through <laughs> airport it was called the airport interdiction unit a lot of direct flights from Miami straight to Detroit a lot of cocaine being trafficked back and forth et cetera et cetera. So when I was a patrolman over at Jackson, I was on the SWAT team as well, and uh, Jackson Police Department, mm. and I was on the SWAT team. And so one of the bosses in Detroit decided he wanted to start a SWAT team. Even though I was a young agent, I had the most experience as SWAT. So he called me in. And he said, "Hey, you want to you want to help me start this SWAT team?" And I'm oh, thinking, for the DEA, for the DEA in de- downtown Detroit. And hmm. I'm thinking to myself, you know, here I am couple of years on a job two or three years and i got the big boss in here talking to me about swat and all that and i'm like we need grenades we need <laughs> we need ak's <laughs> no but it was it was uh it was really pretty neat so he ended up sending me to the fbi swat academy um i was one of four de agents ever to go to through the fbi swat academy is that at quantico yes it's at quantico it was the fbi swat training school it was a three oh, wow. or four week school it was really interesting because just a few weeks before i went uh a SWAT officer um, from um, from the FBI died. Ooh. He was part of their elite SWAT team. Gosh, what's the name of that team? I got a mental mental blank on me. I'll Google it right um, now. Keep where going. they respond? They they live at Quantico. They train every single day. And he had been out on the ropes course and and was repelling. And there's this drill where you don't go until they tell you to go. And they didn't go. And he he got fatigued and he lost his grip and he fell. So a SWAT officer died. Um, the hostage rescue team? No, it's not. A, HRT. That's what's coming up. Yeah, there's another name for it. Uh, FBI Special Weapons and Tactics team? No, teams? that's SWAT, uh, Special Weapons and Tactics. Oh, duh. <laughs> yeah, just say, go Elite FBI Team Based that's at Quantico. That's what I typed in. Elite based, uh, FBI Team Based at Quantico. Uh, so basically what they are is a bunch of agents. And what they do, when they're not training, they're also doing research. Mm. So they might be, be researching hostage negotiation techniques or firepower, or, you know, ballistics and all sorts of things and, and, and the evolution of what kind of vehicles to utilize when you're raiding a place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we'll come up with the name of it later on. But they had it a, just keeps telling me HRT, and that's yeah. not what you're talking about. Yeah. So. Well, HRT is one of them. I thought HRT they utilize more locally, but let's just say that it is HRT. And because I went to the school back in the '80s, I, I got a memory blank on that one. But uh, with that being said, so I I ended up helping formulate this SWAT team. Right. Well, what happened was there was this deal that was going on. They said we got this uh, we got this informant that used to run a lot of dope back and forth to Michigan, but he'd fly from South America. So they had this informant that wanted to introduce an agent to some major Colombian drug dealers. And he was a pilot? And he was a pilot. And he was trying to work off his sentence. And so remember, it's all about a team. And why do people become informants? For a lot of reasons. Number one, they got themselves in a bad position. They got to work off time. Two, they want to make money. See, three, they want to eliminate uh, the competition. And it's up for us to up to us to try and figure that out. 
uh, for they do it for religious reasons or mm-hmm. ideal ideology reasons, whatever the case may be. You know, it, it, at uh, the training academy, informant one hundred and one, you got to learn and memorize all those. And you know, why does a person want to become right. an informant? A, B, C, or D, or E, or F, all of the above. But my point is, so they assign me to this this case because he wanted me, knowing that it was going to be a major deal, to coordinate the takedown. And so, oh, so this had been going on for a long time. No, no, it hadn't been going on for a while. It had been going on for about two weeks. Mm. And and they already it, had the takedown. Oh, no, idea. no, no, no. They knew it would lead possibly to a takedown idea. Okay. So we had a we had a guy by the name of Joe. He was a had a Hispanic last name, and I won't tell his name because okay. um He's still alive, and he worked undercover on this case. He made the very first undercover meeting with the bad guy. And then Joe got promoted and transferred. So he had to leave Detroit, and he went back to Texas or or someplace. But before, they said, who's going to go undercover? And my boss said, well, Kenny, you know more about the case than anybody else because you've been studying it. You're the case agent. You're going to put it all together. Because remember, when, when you're... Listeners are listening to agents speak. It's always important for the agent to remember to know your audience. So there's a difference between a case agent and an undercover agent. Mm. Very rarely are case agents undercover agents because the case agent has to know everything that's going on where the undercover agent just needs to know what's going on in his little world. Mm. So the case agent always have to be aware of is the undercover agent in danger or whatever, whereas the undercover agent also known as the UC, never really needs to know like who's processing the evidence over here or who's on this surveillance team or who's doing this. He has one job and one job only, and that's to can be aware of his surroundings and negotiate the deals right. with the bad guy right. and then coordinate with the case agent. So I was the case agent, and he said to me, why don't you just take over the undercover duties? And I'm thinking, okay, in the academy... He told you, case agent and undercover agent should never be the same guy. So, but he was the boss. So I listened to him <laughs> and I thought, okay. And guess what? It was the best thing that ever happened to me because I became the case agent and the undercover agent. And I was working with this other unit that I was assigned to. Um, at the time, I was assigned after I left the airport when I could walk better. I was assigned to the Dearborn, Michigan task force that focused on Middle Eastern Lebanese heroin traffickers that were smuggling heroin from the Middle East to Dearborn area, to the Dearborn area. How were they doing that? Oh, it's it's many different ways. Okay. You know, it's like, you know, they they... They they had they were organized crime themselves. They had their people in Dearborn. They had their drug dealers and drug smugglers based. Same as the Colombians. Same as the Thai. Same as the Mexicans. Same Such as a everybody random else. Place though, you know, I would think like Miami, Norfolk, Elizabeth Port, something like that. You're talking about like the middle of America. And the reason is because they can trust their own culture. So you got the Lebanese folks living in Dearborn, who mm-hmm. again, ninety nine point nine percent were good people. Yes. You just had that 0.1% that were drug dealers that would coordinate with their home country. And they spoke a different dialect. They spoke Arabic, Urdu, and Farsi and Mm -hmm. different languages. So wiretaps and and things of that nature were very difficult to do, very caustic, just very difficult because of the foreign language. It's... Um, and so I was assigned to that team. I worked with Dearborn police officers. It was a task force. Then I got called in to be run the SWAT program on this. And then next thing I know, I'm working the undercover aspect and I brought my entire team and, and almost the entire team were senior agents to me. They were local narcs with the Dearborn police department Mm -hmm. that I was the new guy assigned, but then all of a sudden they're thrown in this position where now we have an international major drug deal going on. Mm. So I said it was one of the best moves that ever happened to me because what happened was we convinced the Colombians through a series of undercover negotiations that I was in to deliver a DC-6 filled with marijuana and cocaine from the northern coast of Colombia to a small town in downriver Michigan onto an airport on an island known as Gross Hill 
and they delivered 670 kilograms of cocaine and nine tons of marijuana on this DC-6 cargo plane that landed at six o'clock in the morning on this clan, on this, what used to be a military base. Now, now it was a recreational airport in this small little island, 20 minutes south of Detroit. You were starting this though. I, I might've lost you for sure. one second in there because I was trying to sure. keep track of all of it in my head before you were getting into that. You started this though with the Lebanese trafficking. No, in. no. The parallel was it has nothing to do with the Lebanese. Okay. I was okay. assigned to Dearborn to work on that task force. And then my boss asked me to run this program uh, on this one major case. That so I started to. to and it. because the Dearborn officers were assigned to the DEA task force, it doesn't mean all their work happens in Dearborn. They're what's called task force officers. They're sworn in basically as federal agents. So they have national jurisdiction right. as well. They're, right. So they're, they're task force agents. And, and so they became my partners on this operation. And so we convinced the Colombians. And by Colombians, who specifically? Well, we, through a series of different networks of informants and working our way up the chain, ultimately the person that gave the permission to do this operation was a guy named Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha. Oh, yeah. And if you read Pablo Escobar's biography, he was one of the people that mentored Pablo Escobar in the beginning. Yeah. He ultimately was shot down. Uh, he was killed killed by the Colombians in a, in a pursuit shot from a helicopter, and him and his son were both killed. And uh, I think I showed you some pictures of that earlier. Of the aftermath. I hate to see it. Of the aftermath. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, so we convinced them to deliver us the 670 some kilograms of cocaine, nine tons of marijuana to this small airport. Make a long story short, we get all the drugs. I meet with the Colombians as they get off the plane. Some Colombians jumped on the plane from South America and uh, met with them. And then we took all the drugs. We pretended we were offloading. I was going to send the marijuana through to Canada is what I told them to sell to Canadian hash oil dealers and told them I got a bunch of marijuana for you. And I was supposed to send the cocaine to New Jersey and New York. Wait, take me there though, real quickly, if you don't mind. Sure. What, what are they like? Like, and so they get off this plane, you've agreed through intermediaries as you laid out that they were gonna do this. And they actually sent a couple of their, I guess, more senior type individuals That's exactly here. Right. They get off the plane, you're with other people who are all a part of this task force. Obviously, yeah, no, well, I, it was only me and an FBI agent working undercover together. The task force helped arrange things like they were surveillance coordinators right. and things of right. that nature. Meaning you had other people in the area. Oh, but they, tons of people in the area. But they get off this kind of nondescript, this isn't like a major airport port obviously or anything it's, right it's no this. we're in the middle of nowhere and, and and i'm glad you brought that point up because the main guy in the plane was a guy named flacco that was his nickname joe joe flacco <laughs> no it wasn't joe <laughs> no, it wasn't joe from the university of what was it delaware at yeah, one time yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Played for casey so, keeler down there so um it was a guy named flacco and he gets off the plane and he's kind of like stretching his legs a little bit and kind of going like this because it was warm being in the back of a cargo or cold being in the back of a cargo plane. He looks around and goes, I've been here before. And I'm like thinking to myself, that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> that was interesting. He said that. We could never confirm that later on that, that he had been there or not. But interestingly enough, I mean, this was a huge deal. We yeah. had well over 100 agents working on this thing when the plane landed. We had agents in the tower. We had agents at the police station. We had agents surrounding the island. There were only uh, two bridges on and off the island. So I'll put a map of the island in the corner of the screen okay. for people to see. As sure. Well. Gross Eel Island. Yep. And, um, and so... We convinced them. They brought it all up. I said to them, look, we're going to wait till some of our prospective buyers, you've got prospective buyers, we're going to put this in a warehouse. We put the warehouse over in Dearborn, Michigan, mm. uh, where we had this warehouse where we put all the dope in the warehouse. And over the course of the next handful of days, different people came in to take a look at the product. And so we videotape all of that. So we get them. So they're part of the conspiracy. And... Uh, then ultimately, a few days later, we invite all of them at the same time to come pick up their product. And when everybody's in the room, I give what's called the bus single signal, and everybody, all the cops come out of the woodwork. What was the signal? Uh, at that time, uh, in that deal, what happened was I was speaking to one of the folks that was there from Colorado 
thinking he was going to get some of the dope and take it back to Colorado. I asked him if he wanted. I knew it was going to go down. We had everything. So I was just getting everybody ready. I had my I had my pistol in the glove box of the car, and I had another one on me. And um, I basically said, do you want to stick a gum? He goes, yeah, or no, or whatever. I said, oh, well, I want one. And so I reached into the car, reached over the glove box, and as I was reaching the glove box to pull out my pistol, I, my elbow hit the car horn on purpose three times. And when everybody heard honk, 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 it was like I was fumbling around in the car and I was accidentally oh, right, hitting the right, horn. Right. And within seconds, everybody, all the police were converging on. I grabbed my pistol, I turned around, and I looked at him, I said, Peter, you're under arrest. <laughs> and uh, I'm a federal agent. And um, that's how it went down. And so my point on that, whole, you asked what I did and where I was before Bogota and all that. And I said the best thing that ever happened to me was being assigned to that deal because that put me on the map. The supervision in Colombia recognized my talent, and mm. I was fortunate enough to be one of the people selected because one of my former bosses in Detroit was now in Bogota. And so mm. he said, he told the top boss, Joe Toft, who I talked about earlier, right. said, Joe, there's this guy in Detroit. He's a hard charger. He's dedicated, passionate, compassionate, or passionate about the job, et cetera, et cetera. And so they selected me, but I just couldn't go to Colombia. They had to send me to Spanish school. Oh, you need to learn the language first. Exactly. So I went to Washington, D.C. So we, we work on prosecuting this case, and, and it was about six months later I got selected for Bogota. So, so we're in 88 now when you get selected? Uh, early 88, okay. yeah. And then I go to Spanish language school and was in language school for seven months in Virginia at the Foreign Service Institute and learning language, Spanish language. There was five people in the class, and we sat in the classroom for six months, six and seven months. Wow. Eight to five and learning Spanish, just a room smaller than this. Yeah, and uh, they were Department of State officials. I think one ATF guy that was going to go to Mexico, and they were teaching us the language. But our professor always told us, "Hey, you married guys here, pay real good attention here in class, because when you get Columbia or when you get to your designation, you're not going to really have a chance to speak a lot of Spanish outside of the office because you're going to go home to your families and speak English probably." Mm. That's if you had, I, I should clarify. Were you married? It, uh, well, I should clarify one thing. Families weren't allowed to come to Columbia at that time. So it was if <clears throat> you brought your wife, you couldn't bring kids right, at that okay. time. Um, and I was not married. And, be, and the professor would say, for you single guys, <laughs> when you get to Columbia. You're going to have fun. You will learn what a long hair dictionary really looks like. And you're scratching your head. The bottom line is you're going to be out. You're going to have some drinks. You're going to go out for dinner. You're going to socialize. Yeah. You, it was a very addictive job. You worked your ass off. But then again, you were human. So you went out periodically and, and you had fun wherever it may be, whatever might, might have been a nightclub or whatever. But there were also times when there were threats involved against us where we couldn't go to any places and you had to go to the office and go straight home or whatever the case may be. When, you're, I, when you're doing this, though, and, uh -huh. then, and in these classes, it's obviously a few months after you get assigned. Did you, when, when you got the assignment, did you have any idea? Did they, they give you details of what you would be doing down there? Or was it just like, we're sending you down to the task force, well, you'll figure it well, out Well, what would happen is you would you would call agents and say, "What's it like? What do you do down there?" And you know, and when I went down there, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I I got involved with a lot of different operations in my seven years there. I ran a cargo smuggling program that was responsible for seizing multi dozen tons of cocaine throughout the world yeah. because cargo ships and aircraft that were leaving. I, I was involved in this cargo smuggling program. I ran it with a customs guy. I was involved with the fugitive extradition program. Um, I was very proud of that program. I was also involved in a program that I helped create called Operation Dustbuster, where we seized airplanes from drug dealers in Colombia, and we would utilize small little vacuums that had a little pouch in it that would save all the particles in the airplane, and we would send that off to the lab. And if we had a certain percent of cocaine residue, we knew mm. that that plane would utilize to smuggle drugs. 
Operation Dustbuster, we would seize airplanes. We were what responsible. What a name, yeah, I, I named it. I named it. Yeah, I was pretty proud of that That's one. That's incredible. So um, we were responsible for the very first drug smuggling plane to be seized, and the Colombians ultimately took it, painted it white, green, put their their numbers on it. It became a Colombian aircraft. So I got involved with a whole bunch of things. I was then assigned to the intelligence unit there, and then ultimately they, they had a huge shakeup. I was working in the intelligence unit on the drug smuggling program through Cargos, and they had this all office meeting and they said, okay, folks, and I was I was kicking ass, I was doing great. It was called, um, um, the operation was called um, Backlash, Operation Backlash. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I was killing it. It was easy for me by this time. I had, I had informants in Cartagena and Barranquilla and all over the country telling me where drugs were being smuggled into cargo shipments, whether whether they put them in a box of coal that they're shipping to another country like and or whatever. There would be ton or fruit going to Miami, stuff that was in these cargo containers. And so I had the forms all pre-printed out. I had contact with agents all around the world. Um, I could make a phone call to one person and boom, you know, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a team on this. So my point is this is one of the assignments I had. And so they call an all office meeting and they say, we've decided we're gonna do some changing around here. And I'm sitting in the back and thinking, okay, my job's secure, meaning I'm, I'm doing a great job. What year or, is this? Uh, this this would have been in 90. Oh, okay. Um, can I stop no, wait, you? This would have been in 91, more or less. Go can, ahead. I, can I stop you for, sure. just before we get all the way sure. there? Because what's clear is obviously you did a lot there. You were originally, I believe you told me were Assigned there for two years, you ended up being there for seven. So yes, it's two year increments with a maximum of six. But I stayed an extra extra year because I asked for a, um, I appealed my transfer. It was even a promotion that I delayed because I wanted to finish the case. I was zeroing wow. in on the guy that kidnapped the two agents and shot him oh, in 1982. I caught him in October of '95, and after we caught him, I was out of the country within a week. Got I it. went. I went back home. So, so there were a lot of different assignments that I had over the time. But when you go down there, so you you learn the language and you go down there, and you already highlighted some of the stuff you were doing. But day one, you know, what's actually? Let me back up for a second. Before then, this is a more important question. At what point does Pablo Escobar like the idea of him come on your radar, where you're thinking about it every day? Let me pick up where I was. Where okay. I was, we called the office. They called the office meeting in ninety. No, um, it was ninety ninety one, sometime okay. around there. I forget exactly. Um, but uh, they said we're going to make changes, and I'm thinking, well, my job's secure. I'm not going to be assigned to this, or I might go on a jungle program temporary assignment, which I did all that stuff as well. But uh, the very first name they mentioned, the first person we're going to transfer from the intelligence group over to the other group, Operation Boulevard, is Ken McGee. And my jaw about hit the ground because I was very tight with the boss, Joe Toft, and the other guy. And uh, he said, you're now assigned to the Medellin group. And that was Operation Boulevard. Yeah, along with Murphy and Penny and a handful. I don't think Penny, Murphy was there yet. Pena was there. Pena got there before me. And they're the, just for people, I think we said this earlier, but they're the two main Characters protagonists and, within Narcos. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Again, Hollywood took their liberties and their, their creative geniuses and molded this whole thing to just make the whole search like that was Steve and Javier. Believe me, they did a great job. They're very good agents, but it was a team effort. Right. Um, and there's a lot of things on Narcos that are not in alliance with the way we really operate in mm. DEA. Got it. Okay. I mean, I, I'm so, kind of used to the yeah, idea that a lot yeah, of like these things are Sleeping exactly. with informants gets you fired. It doesn't get you information. It gets you fired. If they find out about uh, yeah. it. Yeah. Well, if they find <laughs> out about it, you're fired. And yeah. you should be, as a matter of yeah. fact. Yeah. Um, but uh, so after the meeting, I go in and see my boss. And I said, what did I do? What did I do wrong? And this was a lesson in leadership I learned. And he looked at me and he says, you don't get it, do you? I said, what? And he goes, you didn't do anything wrong. You're going to get received a super great award for all the work you've already done. You've seized tons of cocaine coordinating with groups all around the world. 
you took that program and built it to what it was. You didn't do anything wrong. You did everything right. But you're not challenged anymore. And that's why I want you in the Medellin group. I want you to be challenged. I want you to work in that group. And I want you to learn and take that skill and that passion and that energy you have. And so I went in the office kind of upset because I had it going pretty well. I was traveling all around the country, right. meeting with informants. I'd go, to, I'd go to Cartagena, Columbia, right? I'd check into a hotel. And I had it scheduled where I would meet an informant at 9 o'clock at one hotel, to, not my hotel ever. They didn't know where you stayed. 9 o'clock at this hotel, 10 o'clock at this cafe, 12 o'clock at uh, this restaurant, 4 o'clock at this beachside resort bar, whatever the case might be. I would meet with informants all day long and pay them the money that I would give them to provide me information. I had the life of Riley. It was going great. But my boss knew I wasn't challenged. And that was what changed right then and there. I ended up going into that group. And uh, shortly, I ended up uh, being promoted, not, not an official promotion, but an internal um, promotion where you get more responsibility to something called backup supervisor. Javier Pena was senior to me. Normally, he would have been the backup supervisor, but Javier was working on the Medellin program with Pablo, mm. and Pablo was one of my assignments to work on a team, but they needed a backup supervisor, so they picked me. And I'm really glad they did, because I was able to be the buffer between management and the street guys while I was a street guy, and be able to convince uh, upper management that we would be able to do certain things. So that's how I ended up becoming very close with Joe Toft. And uh, yeah, Penny would always come to me and say, they always listen to you. Why don't you go in and <laughs> why don't you go in and ask for this or ask for that? And, and uh, so um, that's, that's where it happened. And but that's how it happened. Here's what's really confusing to me. This is the part I can't really rectify in my mind. Obviously, like you liked what you were doing, you were doing cool shit and you were stopping all kinds of things around the world with cargo and working cross agency and things like that. But you get assigned, this is 1991, as you said. Mm -hmm. This is two years before Pablo got hit, December 93. So it's a couple years, two, three years, whatever it is. It was around before, yeah. before he dies. He has been in power wreaking havoc now since, like he's been a household guy since probably the mid 80s. Right. You get assigned to the team to take down the biggest criminal of all time. And your thought is, wait a second, this other thing, like, because the original question I asked you was, when did Pablo Escobar become like a core thought in your day? And it sounds to me like from 88 to 1990, he wasn't. Well, let me clarify something, and that is he was. Because when you're an agent in Colombia, every day you're involved, all the agents are involved in the same briefings. So, but there are certain people that have different responsibilities. For example, we had a guy that was full time assigned to the jungles to go out and destroy cocaine laboratories. But periodically, other agents would be assigned to go do that. I was one of those guys. Mm. Spent a lot of times in the jungles blowing up cocaine laboratories, blowing up clandestine airstrips where drug smuggling planes would land. Well, we'd blow holes in them so they couldn't land their airplanes. They'd divert to another area. We'd seize the airplane or whatever. And the same with the fugitive program. You know, there was a guy assigned to the Fugitive Program. Ultimately, that became me after the Pablo Escobar thing. And, um, and so everybody had an assignment that they were responsible for, but everybody would get all the same briefings every day. We would all know what everybody's working on. And there was something that we called the duty agent. The duty agent was every week, it would rotate. Any calls or tips that came in, you answered the phone or you met the person in the lobby or or whatever. So the duty agent could be something from, oh, we got a call from our London office that wants some information on a passport of a Colombian person that they arrested there, and they want you to check with the local Colombians to see what flight he flew out on. That's a duty agent responsibility. Oh, we have, uh, and so you'd write a report and do it. And so you'd have some of the some of the lesser jobs that you'd have to do just for that week. But then also informants would come in. So you come in, and this one informant came in, for example, one day, and um, I, you never interview informants without another agent. So I, Murphy, or I'm sorry, Penny, is that the official rule, or is that actually how it went down? No, that's mostly the official rule. If you had to meet with an informant alone, you would have to document as to the reasons why. 
but how uh, better stated question I, I asked that the wrong way how often were guys breaking that rule not often really not often yeah i almost don't believe that yeah well you're gonna have to believe it because okay. i'm saying it i don't have a choice yeah i wouldn't lie to you uh, you know what? i'll bet you didn't break that rule very much no well but i'll bet other guys did. no i'm not breaking the rule if i follow the protocol and advise that i've got to meet the personal right law. and i'll bet a lot of other guys didn't no for the most part, because it wasn't too hard to sit there and say, I got to meet with this person on the north side of Bogota in a hotel. And keep in mind, it didn't have to be an agent, too. It could be a Colombian police officer. Okay. And at times, back in the day, we even sometimes had a secretary come in. That was we, we frown upon that now because you're putting them in a position that you don't want to. Or you would have a secretary look through a two-way glass to make sure everything is right and they right. documented that they witnessed the conversation. Right. So you've got all these different roles that we all play, but an informant comes in and says, I've got some information on Pablo Escobar. So you start writing it. And if it start writing it down, if it starts to look credible, you may call the person, like in that case, Pena. You know, like Penny and I were once, I got a call and I took Javier in. It was really interesting. We had this guy comes into the embassy with a suitcase and there was nothing, there was nothing in the suitcase. Right. And he says, I want to talk to you about a new smuggling technique. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, there's a technique that can smuggle two pounds of, or two kilograms of cocaine in the united states with no one even knowing it's cocaine he goes what are you talking about and murphy or penny and i are looking at each other like what are you talking about and he puts a suitcase on the counter and he goes there's the two kilograms of cocaine obviously what do we do we open it there's nothing in there it looks less like a samsonite bag what it was was it was a hard acrylic bag that they mixed the acrylic and all those those um those substances the composites and blended cocaine into it <laughs> and they made a hard shell briefcase and penny and i were like this is fascinating so we said how do we extract how do we extract the cocaine and he goes you need this kind of acid and this kind of acid i said uh, you didn't happen to bring that, did you? <laughs> and he said, I did, but they confiscated it at the front desk where you come into the embassy, which we knew they would. Could you imagine if these guys spent this time trying to cure cancer? So, We'd be there. We'd so, be there. <laughs> so, but the guy, and unfortunately, the guys who created all this stuff are probably all dead because yeah. of cancer, because of all the fumes they're sm smelling. So, so uh, uh, Javier and I ended up getting uh, the the stuff the, the the acids the sulfuric acid and a couple other components, um, and he showed us how to do it. So we cut a piece of the plastic off, we poured this stuff in, we watched it fizz and everything. We put it in a, like a cotton rag. We went like this, and we got we got all the materials. All the liquid comes out on the bottom, and on the top is all the composites, uh, the polymers that aren't cocaine. And there it is, powder. Son of a bitch. And it was unbelievable. But my point is, that was a duty call. Just came in on a duty call. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody got a call that they're smuggling um, you know, 500 kilograms of cocaine out from um, uh, Barranquilla, Colombia, and it's going to probably go on a certain vessel, but they don't know what vessel, they would at that time they would call me and the Operation Backlash guy. Or after I left back, Backlash, they called in another agent by the name of Steve, and he, he would take the information. So we all had a working knowledge. How many SEALs have you interviewed? It's actually a good question. I think I've had zero in here so far. Okay, well, if yeah. you study the techniques of SEALs, they are all cross-trained. They are all experts in one area, yes. but they're all cross-trained yes. in every other yes. area. And that's the exact same thing it is with a DEA agent in Bogota. So Pablo Escobar was on everybody's mind all the time, all the time. I just, I, I can't wrap my head around the idea that when you were literally put on the team that was going to be hunting them down, you thought that was like a demotion. Because like in, I mean, to the idiot like me at home, just looking at pop culture, I'd think that that was like going to the fucking Super Bowl. Number one is I didn't think it was a demotion. I just couldn't understand it. Mm. You know, and I thought... Okay, I'm king of the hill right now on my program. I got the respect of everybody all around the country, and now I'm the new guy assigned to another program. 
Even though I knew a lot about that program, I was the new guy on that team and quickly became the assistant supervisor, the backup supervisor, and and did all sorts of things. So it was I didn't think of it as a demotion. It was more I couldn't understand. Mm. I couldn't understand leadership's move because I was getting praise all the time. So as it turns out, here I am. I get transferred in the group, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because the next thing you know, I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm working. I'm getting to know the head boss better, um, which is always career enhancing. And I wasn't kissing his ass because I argued with him. He was Joe was very competitive. You know, once a week we'd play volleyball, <laughs> and we'd play volleyball the teams at the embassy. And he was so competitive. And one time he started screaming at me because of a. Something that I did, I said, I said to him under my breath, fuck yourself. <laughs> I said no, that. And one, of, and one of the family members were watching saying, I can't believe he just told <laughs> Joe Toff to fuck himself. <laughs> and uh, the next day I get called to in his office. I get called up to his office and I'm thinking, oh man, I'm in trouble now. Kind of like, that would be like a, a, a sergeant telling a general to go screw himself, right? While they're playing horseshoes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he calls me and he says, hey, I want to talk to you about this case. And I just read this, this report that you wrote and I want to talk to you about this. I'm like, okay, all right. And so I told him all about it. And then, uh, and then a few minutes later, he goes, how are you doing today? I said, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I said, are we okay? He goes, yeah, why? <laughs> I said, oh, I don't know. And I said, oh, just wondering if everything's okay. And knowing that this competitive guy who didn't take shit uh, from anybody and the truth is, it was in such of the heat of the battle in volleyball, <laughs> contact sport, um, he didn't even remember. Mm. He just looked at it as like part of business. I said, you don't remember? He goes, what? And he goes, I told you to go fuck yourself. And he goes, <laughs> you did? Yeah. I said, I did. And he goes... <laughs> Well, he goes, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> and that he, was might the not, end of it. he might not have said that like that, but make a long story short. So I was confused as to why I was doing such a great job and I got moved. And a lesson in leadership, and I've used it numerous times later on, that you know, mentoring other people in different programs and different ways is extremely important. And that's exactly what he did. And the, uh, the guy that worked for him, his name was Jerry Reinhardt who I went to Pablo Escobar's Finca Los uh, Napoles uh, with, and you saw some pictures of him earlier. And yeah. Jerry just died a couple of years ago of a brain tumor, but he was mm -hmm. an outstanding agent as well. And they sat back and made the team, and they it was like major league manager, a major league manager deciding who he wants at what position, and that's exactly what they did. So, How many people were on that team? Uh, the, in that group, at that time, there were six people in that group. In the Merv, Escobar group? Yeah, yeah. But keep in mind, there's only about 16, 12 or 14 agents in the entire office at that time. In Colombia. At that time. I went and visited the office about eight years ago, and the embassy had changed location. And there's only one office down there, right? Well, there was one in Cartagena, and I believe now, or there was one then in Barranquilla, and then one in Cartagena. And they had both like 12? No, the, age, the office in Barranquilla only had five or six agents. So you're telling me small. that during this war on Escobar, we had, call it round, rounder number, 18 agents for the DEA down there? Probably a lot less than that, too, when you think about it, because Barranquilla was in their own world. They, they handled northern coast cartels they would get information periodically but they'd have to forward it to us and then the dea bogota group had group one group two and the intelligence group the intelligence group had i think four agents and the escobar group had five or six agents and the other other group had four five or six agents and that included a supervisor so but cumulatively there was probably hell somewhere in here i have uh I had the information. I kept a card with every agent's name, and I still have it from then, where we had contact numbers and radio code numbers and all that. But it wasn't a lot. Then we also had what's called intelligence analysts mm -hmm. that would uh, were assigned to the intelligence group, and one was assigned to the Escobar case that would basically manage all the massive amount of documentation, you know, sightings and you know statistical data on seizures and who was killed, and would write the. Um, executive summary reports on searching for Pablo, and they would have an analyst assigned to the 
cargo smuggling program too. And some of the analysts had two or three different jobs. How many so, guys were like you and Pena though, like actually out in the field, like working and, and developing informants? Like how many agents were like that? In Bogota, 10 That's at the not time. A lot. Now, I went down there a handful of years ago, more like a decade, and the office had changed from one embassy to an, the other. And the first embassy, the one that I was assigned to, was in downtown Bogota, in the middle of a district where there were banks and they, you know they had barricades around the embassy and all that stuff. But it was it was a small building. It was a four story building, and that's all it was was a building. Now it's over by the airport and it's massive amount of property with a fence around it and all sorts of and for if you entered the embassy from the outside to get in the embassy old embassy from the outside of the front door it was a 30 yard walk mm. now it's like a quarter of a mile drive from the main road so there weren't a lot of us and there were guys that came and went and guys that came and went so the life of a DEA agent in Bogota Colombia was a very, as I said to you early, it was addictive work. You were involved in so many different things. And you could, and, and it's the same way as a DEA agent in the United States. In the morning, you could be working surveillance in the afternoon undercover. And in the mid afternoon, you're doing a search warrant helping another agent out. So you have to be um, multi focused on doing a lot of different things and being able to adapt very quickly as to how your daily events are going to go. And you learn how to prioritize. Uh, you know, I'm going to go meet with this informant. We're going to talk about a drug smuggling deal. And somebody calls and says, hey, we just got a threat on an agent. We got to go respond to this area and check out this location. You drop that appointment, you move somewhere else. Hey, we, you know, we, you know, the boss calls you and says, uh, what's going on? And I say, well, we've got an airplane out. They're getting ready to land at a small airstrip. And uh, he's going to drop off some agents that are going to work with the Columbia National Police. He says, stop, re-divert that plane, drop off the agents. We need to take our plane and fly it to this other area because I just got a call from a general. Five Colombian police officers were ambushed, and they have no techno or no capacity to get into that area mm. and drag those officers out. And that happened. Five officers, all wounded, all shot up. Several of them died in the back of a DEA airplane where Joe Toft sent the airplane to go get these wounded officers that were killed in some sort of fire shot in some sort of firefight to help transport them back to Bogota. And so those are the kind of things. And then, then there's the fire drills, you know, you got the head honchos in Washington, DC. You say, <laughs> I want this and I want it now, or what something called a CODEL, which means a congressional delegation. You got to get this because we got this congressman visiting and, and you know, and Joe Toff knew that sometimes you'd have to appease the people in Washington, D.C. or headquarters to get the job done. So the CODEL comes down and you, you know, you take them out to dinner and you provide protection for them and all that. Or, you know, Joe assigned me once to a Hollywood script. There was a, I think, a TV show at one time called Drug Wars. And, um, and uh, he assigned me to help the Hollywood team <laughs> for two days. I said, why me? He goes, because you know everybody. And lie to them about everything. Yeah, no, no, you know every no. What they want to do is film drug wars, and they got approval from DEA Washington D.C. But they came down. And they said we need something that looks like a Colombian um, motorcycle. We need to get Colombian police uniforms. <laughs> we need license plates that are Colombian license plates. And I had connections everywhere, so I called this guy. I said, "Look, can I borrow three or four uniforms? Oh, I need this. I need. Can you give me a couple of those license plates that say Colombian police on them? You know." And we did that so the Hollywood guys would have authentic. And it props but the idea is the longer you were there the more people you knew but here's the other thing and i just keep thinking this like obviously you mentioned you went to dc and learned spanish for six seven months so you're speaking the language and everything i assume si, pretty, senor. pretty pretty proficiently at the time and you were a single guy so i'm sure you learned it from a lot of ladies down there but you know you're really white like you you don't look colombian exactly and you're putting your fingers all over the place it sounds like how the <clears throat> hell are you keeping your cover <clears throat> like, because well, these people would kill on demand if they even thought, like, oh, maybe, maybe that I guy you. is. I got you. You know what I mean? I got you. And I see what you're saying. And you are right. I'm very white. And, and Colombian, I, I have a daughter that's Colombian, as a matter of fact. Um, I married her mother. We're not married anymore in the United States a couple of years after I left Colombia. But mm. product of the marriage is uh, my daughter, who's a 
beautiful 25. Who set up this thing, by the way. Shout out to Daniela. Yeah, she did a great job. She's a social media expert. She's a graduate of a prestigious university here in the United States. And, uh, Michigan? Uh, no, in Chicago. <laughs> In Chicago area, and she's um, she's just a good kid who learned a lot, and she, she's half Colombian. And so a lot of times our conversations are in Spanish. So mm. you say at one time I spoke Spanish, I still try and continue to speak Spanish. That's great. Yo quiero hablar español contigo, y si tus personas que están visitando tu podcast y quiere hablar conmigo en español, por favor, mándame un email y podemos charlar en español otro día. Gracias. But... Um, let me take you in the life of being at the embassy. The embassy is not just DE agents. There's other foreign agencies, three-letter agencies that are foreign in the country. Oh, you one. took the words out of my mouth. Number one. Number two, there's also the State Department that processes applications for passports. Mm -hmm. There's also... Yeah, um, how many passports do you have sitting here right now, by the way? <laughs> yeah, there's also... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This yeah. looks like a printing clinic over here. You know, it's kind of funny. Let me see those real quick. Um, but what I was going to say was uh, that there's a lot... There's uh, foreign aid. There's mm -hmm. Department of State. There's um, all sorts of different things. You know, whether it's helping crop supplementation, there's also military groups assigned there that work with the Colombian military for training. So the embassy has got hundreds of people in it that are Americans. But they so, don't like, but, the, but to be clear, and maybe I'm skipping a little bit here, but I they don't you. care about any of that. I they, got, if you're I, an American, they don't, they think you're evil. They don't I, want I you. got your question. They, they normally don't think you're evil. They just think the DEA is evil. So for really? the yeah for the most part now then there's the guerrilla trafficking groups and the guerrilla groups that will kidnap Americans if they have a chance right. because of the ransom and all that but basically what you do as a DEA agent if you are cornered say hey you're an American whatever say yeah I work at the embassy and you make up a department oh what do you do and you could make up whatever agency you wanted to oh I work with the Department of um, I work with the Department of Farmland Aid. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're helping crop supplementation for Colombian farmers to teach them how to grow better crops, and so the bug infestation isn't going to destroy their crops and whatever the case may be. And you rattle off some stuff and you throw out some, you throw out a few acronyms and just say something like, "Yeah." And um, and so we work very closely with the government of Colombia's uh, DOF, um, and they're like DOF, you know. But you act like you know, and they pretend like they know what mm. the DOF is. Is, and I just made it up, <laughs> means nothing. But my point is, you can convince people that you're not with the DEA, that you're just a state department employee working at the embassy, and that's what you're assigned there for. And you better be able to do that very good. Otherwise, you're not going to live for a long time. And if you don't do it well, like if you do do it well, though, it's just, I mean, obviously you made it clear right there. It is just surprising to me given what it, I mean, let's call it what it, what it is, what a terrorist guys like, like Escobar were, yeah. the Cali cartel and everything. The fact that they wouldn't just be like, ah, oh, we don't like him. We're not sure. Or, you know, it, yeah, he's not DEA, but he's an embassy guy. Fuck him. Kill him. Like that to me, okay. it seems like that would just be so uh, maybe not commonplace because you're an American. There's some things that go along with that, but these guys certainly didn't bat an eye. Right. Well, you would also carry different identification. For example, you fly in and out of the country, you have the diplomatic passport. And you're holding this up to the camera right now exactly. for people watching. Exactly. And the diplomatic passport is what grants you a lot of immunities. And so it helps you in a lot of different ways. But you don't carry this around. When you get this Colombian passport, the Colombian government issues you a small little booklet. It's red. It's called a red carnet, which means red mm. card, basically. And you also, if you are traveling anywhere, you also want to carry the blue passport. Because if for some reason something happens when you're on the plane and you're flying from point A to point B, I might have to fly to Chile or to Ecuador or someplace like that. You are carrying this because that's how you get into the country, but you want to have this as well. Because what happens is if something happened, if there was a terrorist act and they kidnapped or grabbed you, at, snatched you at the at the uh, airport or they hijacked the airplane or something like that, you are trained to dump this passport. You want to the get rid of it. diplomatic one. Yeah, you want to get rid of it. 
if if you know it's a criminal element taking you wants to take yeah. you out because yeah. all of a sudden your stock rises tremendously we yeah. have a government employee oh you could be an agent you could be whatever so you would dump that and keep this my daughter when she was being raised in columbia after my wife and i separated uh she was instructed to tell people she was canadian uh because she looked she had blondish light colored hair and blue eyes and uh, uh, not as pale white as I am, but she was obviously a white girl, but she was instructed to tell people she was Colombian. Or, I'm sorry, Canadian. And and Why did it matter at that, because, because of your history there? It was not only my history, but uh, I guess it's the, for the, <laughs> what's a good analogy I could come up with? For people that want to kidnap people, the Americans are the prime rib of the steak world it's <laughs> Canadians call, not so much it's kind of no of the kidnapping world right. where money will be right. paid more right you know um the the prime rib versus the ribeye my point is nothing against the Canadians it's just that the the foundation of America it's like they think we're rich you know they think that we have all this money at our disposal and they will look at it and say the american government will pay and the american you compare the size of the canadian embassy to the size of the american embassy it kind of shows the differences so she was instructed to tell people she was canadian how good was her canadian accent <laughs> yeah a, a lot of a's yeah so anyway when you 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 get these diplomatic passports and then there's another passport it's called the official passport that you might use for something else and so over time you just wear out your passports and you get more and more and more of them and so i've always hung on to my passports because whenever you get a top secret clearance you always have to document any foreign country you've ever been mm. in when you've been and where you've been and why you've been and you fill that on out on any of the uh, any of the uh, background sensitive investigation forms how many countries have you been to i haven't counted Ball well park, ballpark uh well over a dozen two dozen not not quite yeah, okay. i don't think two dozen but more than a dozen less than two dozen i did not i've done the european route i didn't do uh the um the far east route right i haven't done much there okay. i mean i've i've been to egypt i've been to jordan i've been to um i've been to germany i've been to several countries in europe several countries in south america you know, you're going to run out of fingers if you're counting. Um, but I've been to a lot of places. But I didn't do much in, a, in the Far East. Mm. Uh, learned a lot about it because you then you go to Washington, D.C., you get assigned to headquarters, and part of your responsibilities is learning about all the right. different countries right. on whatever assignment, top secret assignment you've got at our DEA headquarters, which I ran an intelligence unit out of headquarters during my assignment there. But so you learn, back to your point, pale white guy, yeah, you learn to just... People think that you're a State Department employee or whatever. And that's okay. Yeah. yeah. And then ultimately, I mean, there are a lot of people that learn you're a DEA agent. You've got informants all around the country. They know you're a DEA agent. And you can keep operating. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're meeting with those informants. and But keep in mind, the informants don't want to tell people they just right. met with a DEA agent. Right. But you've got to be careful. Remember I said earlier, when we meet with the informants, I don't sit there and tell them what hotel I'm in. Right. I meet them at different locations. Remember the story I told about the two agents that were kidnapped from the hotel room on February 10th, 1982? Yes. Well, they were in that hotel and people knew they were DEA right. agents and they were kidnapped from that hotel room and taken out and they, both of them were in a series of events shot several times and by the grace of God and their courage and their intestinal fortitude, they survived. And uh, ultimately, I caught the guy that was a ringleader shooting them both, the guy named, by the name of Rene Benitez, the guy whose initials I put on the handcuffs several years before because I was obsessed with finding that guy. <sighs> so you talk awesome. about the different assignments, remember? Yeah. That was my pet project I was always working on, whether I was working in this unit and this unit or this unit or whatever. I was always working on that. Where, so, did, you, where did you say you lived again when you went there? I, I, you mentioned something quickly, maybe like 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, I think. But like, because you're talking about don't know where the location is and everything. But if you live in one place and that's just you know exactly. where you are on Monday and Tuesday, okay. they can know let, that. Let me answer that question in two different ways. Okay. Also, if you're identified as a DEA agent and there's a threat, they do two things. Like Joe Toff would call you in and say, "We have a threat on your life. We're going to take you off the street for a little while until we can ascertain what's going on and cool things off." 
or we're going to send you back home for a few weeks. And if it's a credible threat that we can't neutralize the threat, you get sent home permanently. They normally give you your choice of places to go. And so the goal is not to have a threat against you unless you want to go home. And I've never heard of anybody doing that. But my point is um, the goal is to not get threats against you. And a way I also want to answer that as well is that Kiki Camarena was killed by the Mexican cartels. It's one of the longest investigations DEA has ever had. The case is still open. Prior to us capturing Rene Benitez, that was the longest case ever open until I caught that guy. But Kiki Camarena's case is still open. And what happens is the reason people like Pablo Escobar, Cali Cartel, and Medellin Cartel are hesitant about harming a DEA agent is because they knew. Remember what I talked to you about that rule earlier? Mm. We won't kill you if you don't kill us unless it's a situation where violence occurs. They realized that if they killed an agent, they would undercome the wrath of the government 10 times stronger than it already was. So, and that's what happened with Kiki Camarena. They have not stopped that investigation to this day. Well, I assume you know some of the background there as far as like why that might not be getting fully solved or fully... Litigated. I've watched that documentary, documentary too, and there's a lot of different angles we could take off of that. And All right, guys, that brings us to the end of part one of two with Mr. Ken McGee. Ken was here for like four and a half hours, so we had to split it into two episodes. And so the second one really needs no introduction. We are going to be going deeper and deeper into the Pablo Escobar case and the front row seat, or I should say like the action seat that Ken had in helping take down the biggest, most notorious drug kingpin to ever live. So if you are watching this episode on YouTube or listening on Spotify more than a week after it came out, then guess what? Part two is already up and the link is in the description. If not, I will see you next week. Oh, and I almost forgot. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel on YouTube. And that said, you already know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace.